Hello and welcome to the Open House LGBT Elder Housing Services Virtual Symposium, produced in collaboration with the uh, with Sage and made possible by the generous contributions of the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation. Uh, my name is Ephraim Gaitahun. My pronouns are he, him, and I am the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Training at Open House LGBT Senior Center. Coming to you live from San Francisco, and I am privileged to be your moderator this afternoon. I am delighted to kick off this two-day symposium as we have carefully curated intentional and thought-provoking conversations discussing housing, social services, clinical support, and how it is at their intersection that permit our LGBTQ plus elders to thrive. Founded in 1998, Open House works to center the voices and experiences of LGBTQ plus older adults by providing opportunities to make social connections and build community. We recognize and affirm that LGBTQ plus older adults live at intersections of race, ethnicity, class, culture, HIV status, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, spirituality and ability. And at Open House, everyone is a community member. I also want to acknowledge that despite the good work that happens here at Open House in San Francisco, this building does sit on stolen land and we want to acknowledge the Ramaytush Ohlone people who are the original stewards of this land. And I really encourage each of you to reflect on our contributions to the harm and the violence to the original peoples and to seek opportunities to build in collaboration with the original stewards uh, with them at the helm. So on to our program. It is imperative that housing developers and organizations seeking to house at-risk communities recognize the danger of complacency in the long and arduous work in acquiring LGBT elder affirming housing. Too often the job is considered done once a community member is matched with an eligible home, but what are the parts of the work we are missing in supporting our elders to thrive? We will find out in this stimulating conversation. So without further ado, let me introduce our fabulous guests and speakers. So I'm gonna start with Michelle Cunningham. Michelle Cunningham was born in a family that was rich in traditional values and religion, values that stifle originality and that saw standing out as something to be perceived as negative. But her life has revealed that the opposite is true. Michelle has always had a natural affinity for helping others, and being a woman of the trans experience has provided her with a mission to not only provide others with a better definition for what it means to, uh, to be trans, but also that her intersection of identities has taught her more creative ways to address the needs of the community. Michelle is a program manager who comes to us from Taja's coalition. Taja is standing for the Trans Activists for Justice and Account Accountability Coalition. Michelle and the work happening um, at large at Taja's understands how important it is to promote leadership, collaboration, and stre strengthening the capacity of trans communities and existing transgender serving organizations to end the violence of transphobia. The coalition has been able to identify existing barriers to safe and affordable housing in San Francisco for transgender people. We are so honored to have you, Michelle. Welcome. Yes. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, I am so excited to be involved in this conversation because it is extremely important. And um, again, thank you for having me. Yeah, so so happy to have you, Michelle, thank you. Next up, we have Dr. Kathleen Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan is an accomplished speaker, author, and trainer on issues related to LGBTQ aging, gender equity, aff affordable housing, and social environments. She is the executive director of the Bob Ross Open House LGBT Center in San Francisco, which develops affordable housing for LGBTQ older adults, provides a suite of programs and services, including the nation's first LGBTQ-specific Community Day Services Adult Day Program, in partnership with Unlock and provides comprehensive training to providers in the greater Bay Area on the intersection of race, gender, and sexual orientation to create accepting, supportive environments for LGBTQ seniors. Dr. Sullivan holds a PhD from the Nohad uh, Talon School of Urban Studies and Planning at Portland State University, where she co-authored Oregon's first study on transportation issues for older adults. Welcome, Dr. Sullivan. So happy to have you. Great to be here. Thank you, Ephraim. Good to see yes. you, Michelle. 
Good, Thank you. fantastic. Next up, we have Tony Newman. Tony Newman is the interim president for Lyric, former interim director of employment services for the SF LGBT Center and a faculty member at the Transgender Strategy Center. Tony is the chair of the board of directors for Trans Can Work. Tony is a graduate of Wake Forest University with a bachelor's degree, holds an MBA, and is a current candidate for her JD. Tony was the executive director for St. James Infirmary and the director of development for Maitree Compassionate Care. This resume is impeccable and previously served as the interim director of development and communications uh, to help everyone uh, health and wellness centers. And as a strategic fundraiser, volunteer recruiter, legislative aid for equality in California. And additionally, Tony is a best selling author noted for her memoir, I Rise, The Transformation of Tony Newman, released in 2011. Her memoir was based off the poem, I Rise by Dr. Maya Angelou, who Tony interviewed with in 2012. The memoir has been uh, featured in Ebony and Advocate uh, magazines and nomina nominated for the prestigious Lambda Literacy Literary Award, excuse me. Most recently, the memoir has been produced into a short film titled Heart of a Woman by Alton Demore and Keith Holland, being featured at several film festivals in the USA, Thailand, and Germany. Welcome international superstar, Miss Tony Newman. Thank you, Efren, for having me and hello to my panelists. I'm just so blessed to be here. Thank you. Yes, absolutely honored to have you. Thank you so much, Tony. And next, uh, and uh, last but definitely not least, Dr. Wilfred Labiosa. Dr. Labiosa has been a community leader and advocate for the last 30 years working in the uh, public health field with marginalized communities, such as the Latino and LGBT communities in the United States and Puerto Rico. He has published his research with the duly diagnosed Latino community, both in mental health and substance abuse diagnoses, and has collaborated on books related to the LGBT uh, Latino Latina community in the mental health field. Field. Dr. Labiosa also works as a consultant and supervisor on state, national, and international projects that focus on mental health, HIV AIDS prevention, homelessness, the youth, Latinos, LGBTQ plus individuals, and people with dual diagnoses through uh, evidence-based treatment modalities. Born and raised in Pu uh, Puerto Rico, he graduated with a doctorate degree from S uh, Simmons University School of Social Work and received a master's degree from Northeastern University's Department of Counseling Psychology and a graduate certificate from Suffolk uh, University's Management of Nonprofits. He is currently the CEO of Waves Ahead Corporation, a nonprofit organization in Puerto Rico, focusing on the aging LGBT plus community, managing two community centers, focused on LGBT older adults. Dr. Labioso, welcome to the stage. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, and Dr. Labioso, I can't hear you. Maybe you might uh, be muted. Yes, after a whole year of doing this, we should know It never gets now. old. It never gets old. So I was saying gracias for the invitation and I look forward to the conversation with my fellow panelists. Fantastic, honored to have all of you, thank you so much. So grateful to have each of you for joining us today as we dive into the panel titled, What Are We Missing? A Deep Dive into the Wraparound Support of Housing and Social Services. Each of you have so much to offer to this conversation and I'm so excited to jump right in. So we're just gonna go ahead and dive head first and we're gonna uh, take the first question to you, uh, Michelle. Uh, so, Michelle, you are a tireless advocate and relentless uh, activist in the work for transgender liberation. We dream a day where this kind of resilience is no longer necessary, but are so grateful for your work. It is no secret that the trans community experiences a unique set of barriers from the rest of the LGBTQ plus community and are often excluded from the concerted efforts of nonprofits and social programs. So what has your lifetime of activism and your work at Taj's Coalition specifically identified as the main areas of concern in getting our high risk trans siblings housed and thriving? And what do you and others in the work need from the broader community to be successful? Thank you. Yes, that is a, um, that is a very, very good question to start with. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I guess the, the, the main point to start with is what is the, the, transferable issue concerning most people um, of trans experience or in the LGBTQIA plus community at large. Um, and I think really and truly it's time. Um, and the reason why I say that is because um, I am currently 42 years old and you know I've lived through um, 
a, a very unique period um, in the transgender community, meaning I could see um, a one portion of our community or one side of our community that didn't really have a lot of access to things like employment. Um, they weren't, they had no idea about things like financial literacy. Um, and, you know, sex work was, um, was one of those things that they, that was a vehicle for them to use mm -hmm. to be able to survive in society. Um, when you're young and when, you know, you're, you know, you're living your life and you're doing your things and stuff like that, as you get older, you don't really think about um, saving for your future or having good credit or things of that nature because you don't think that those things are gonna apply to you because you don't really think about tomorrow. You only think about what can you do today. Um, a lot of our community members from, I wanna say, you know, the from the LGBTQIA um, community at large of color have experienced um, some form of this at one point or another where um, you are either, your educational level is um, not as high as you want it to be because you're, because of discrimination and things of that nature, you want to think about your safety versus your education. So you leave school and then it doesn't give you opportunities for things like employment, which affects your credit and so on and so forth. Um, so I want to say that the thing that is impacting our community the most is just that time to um, that to be able to learn how to manage those things now, because now we have to start thinking about them because of um, advances in medicine as well as social advancements for the LGBTQIA community. We now have the opportunity to live longer, healthier lives. And now we have to start thinking about, well, when I get older, who's going to take care of me if I don't have these things set up for myself? This is actually a question I had to think about um, on my own as well, because, you know, I'm not going to say that I didn't think about living past a certain age, but I, I just didn't have time to think about it because trying to access things like education and work and, you know, those things of that nature. And, I, and also finding my identity took a lot of time to actually get to be able to do all of that. So now that I'm in this point in my life, um, now I have gone through educational things and have been able to set up myself for my future. But if I did not have um, the access to that information that is important for you know, just a regular equitable life, I would not be able to be where I am today. So I believe that if we're if we're gonna start anywhere, it should be starting there with how to provide a more equitable existence for our siblings and the LGBTQIA trans community at large. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for that answer, uh, Michelle. I really appreciate what you said. But like, if you're experiencing a life of trauma, you can't lift your head up to survey the land around you and to advance and evolve. And while you know credentials and a, a you know significant resume are, are fantastic, the lived experience is much more valuable. There's that molecular understanding is so important. So I really appreciate uh, that point specifically, Michelle. That was a beautiful answer. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, I'm coming for you next. The next question is to you. Throughout your career, you have earned a reputation as a tireless advocate for elders, the LGBTQ plus community and affordable housing. And as uh, the regional director of Engage Now, you were instrumental in bringing 1,100 new units of intergenerational affordable housing to the Portland metro area and rural Oregon. What high level lessons and advice do you have for other activists and organizations that seek to implement similar projects of such a magnificent, uh, magnificent size? And how do you maintain equity for those seeking to be housed uh, once the project is completed? Dr. Sullivan. <laughs> well, that's a very small question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I would say in particular, you know, this is really cuts across um, many, um, uh, communities, particularly when we're looking at people who um, have economically not been as advantaged um, in our country. So I think it could, you know, it's a very broad uh, community that this would, um, this would apply to. But if I'm looking specifically at the LGBTQ community, I think one of the most important things that I would suggest is we need to realize 
you know, despite all of the gains that we had, um, we've achieved in the last 10, 15 years, we still really need to advocate for ourselves. And I think that is, um, it's an important lesson that we still need to learn. You don't get what you don't ask for. And I think that oftentimes we don't, um, we're not in a position where we can just ask, we need to demand. So that would be really the first thing. And, you know, I think here in California, one, um, one experience that our transgender brothers and sisters just had was uh, the Third Circuit Court deciding that people could misgender or dead name a transgender elder in any long-term care community, including nursing nursing homes. So when people are most frail, um, are least able to advocate for themselves, the Third Circuit Court said, eh, it's not such a big deal if someone misgenders you or dead names you. And that um, is incredibly harmful. So, uh, you know, we had to advocate around that and we're continuing to advocate for an overturn of that decision. So that would be the first big thing is that we need to continue to advocate for ourselves because, you know, no one's going to sort of do this work for us, unfortunately. Um, despite the strides we've made, there are still many times that we can really point to um, being treated differently and being treated less than. So that would be the first thing if you're looking to really develop um, housing and really safe space um, for our community. I think the second thing I would just note is that right now, intergenerational community building is really at the forefront for developers and for some advocates um, who develop housing. And even there are some who are even, you know, proposing changing the way HUD funds the creation of affordable housing to not have these pockets of money, some that go towards families and some that go towards older adults, and you can never mix those communities. And so if you're in organizations that's really looking to develop housing, I would suggest really looking around and seeing who else you could partner with to create an intergenerational campus. That's what we did in Oregon and it was very successful. And I think that for our community in particular, um, you know, many of us, we're not connected to our families of origin anymore. And that is continuing, it's perpetuating, even for younger people in our community. You know, young, young folks uh, are disproportionately, who are LGBTQ, are disproportionately represented in homeless youth and foster youth. And it's like, even though we've made all of these gains, that's still the truth. And so if we can look to, I think, create intergenerational programming, which Open House has a lot of opportunities for that, but then intergenerational housing, I think, is another opportunity that is really just starting to build up steam. And then I would say the last couple of things are, you know, you really have to play the long game when you're developing housing. These things don't happen overnight. Um, Open House now has two um, apartment buildings that we've partnered with Mercy Housing on, um, 95 Laguna and 55 Laguna. I think we kind of need to give them names. But um, at any rate, we're also partnering with Mercy on another development um, on Market Street right around the corner. If we're lucky, even though we're both very established now in housing, Mercy much more so than we are, um, it's gonna take us at a minimum five years to develop that housing. And that's if everything goes perfectly. So it's probably gonna be more like seven years. If you're just starting out and just exploring um, creating housing for the LGBTQ community in your city or state, it will probably take you more than 10 years to actually have it come to fruition. So. Uh, developing housing is, uh, some people say it's a marathon. I think it's an ultra marathon. Um, you know, it's not 26 miles, it's more like 50 miles. So, you know, spread that plan out over a greater time period than, um, than perhaps you would like to. And I think the last thing is creating partnerships. Nobody does any of this work on their own. Uh, developing affordable housing is incredibly expensive. Uh, you know, each one bedroom unit, depending on where you're living and developing, can cost anywhere from $300,000 to $600,000 per unit. So you need to get um, other support. Obviously, there's a lot of public dollars that go into uh, developing affordable housing, but that's not going to pay for everything. And so, you know, we have always at Open House raised additional money so we can create community spaces um, and community programs that 
you know, once someone moves into housing, that's not the end of the job. I always think, you know, as hard and as arduous as it is to develop the housing, the structure, the physical structure, what's oftentimes more important is what is the social structure that you're helping to facilitate? How do we create community? How is it that we create this building and invite people to come and make it their home and then have them feel a sense of belonging, a sense of acceptance so that people can be their true self? Because I believe firmly from my experience, you know, as a 55 year old lesbian, but also as someone who's been working in housing and with senior services that when people feel, when our community feels accepted, welcomed, when they can be their true selves, that's really when they can thrive. So mm -hmm. the building part is important, but it's what goes on in the building and that community um, development that I think is also paramount. Eloquently put, Dr. Sullivan. <laughs> um, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. That's what I, that, that is the main takeaway that I heard there. And so often I see, you know, nonprofits, go through this pattern of trying to reinvent the wheel when there are organizations that are on the ground that are experts in the work and why not whether it's a trans organization have them lead and us support or vice versa whether it's housing whatever the, the case might be but that um that meshing and that collaboration is vital to to get the uh, our community housed and thriving so really appreciate that answer very well thought out um so really appreciate that next miss tony newman coming for you your resume, impressive, might I add, is deeply steeped in the work of many organizations here in San Francisco throughout your career, targeting trans and gender nonconforming community members. Throughout your incredible and honorary work, can you provide a high level assessment of what the cisgender queer community is missing as they attempt to address the social needs of trans seniors and in turn, the LGBTQ plus community at large? I've been, um, thank you, Efren. I've been doing this work for over 15 years and, and um, we have such great allies in the LGBTQ um, community, but the T in my opinion is at the bottom of the barrel. We've always been at the bottom of the barrel because we're the poorest, we're the most uneducated, we have no fin financial resources, we have no ownership of anything. We're our white brothers and sisters, they own homes, uh, in the LGBTQ community. Uh, it was late in my life, I became a, a homeowner. Uh, and that's just not very fortunate for most trans women of color. Um, and we're just not financially prepared due to the struggle of being our authentic self. Uh, that is just what's happening. So I would say to my LGBTQ brothers and sisters, my senior trans folk, they need jobs. Without a job, you can have no financial security. And you'll find that most trans workers are at the bottom of the barrel in these nonprofits. They're the testers. They're the coordinators. They're the outreach. Um, you know, they're not the ones making the decision. You can't have power unless you're at the table. I have strived through my career to try to have power to be able to make decisions that are valuable to my trans brothers and sisters, especially the ones of color my trans brothers and sisters who are not of color seem to thrive better. They have the better jobs, they own homes, but trans uh, people of color are suffering economically, financially, they don't have the jobs and you can get a house, but if you don't have a job and money coming in, you can't maintain that home. I've seen people get put in housing and we celebrated Three months later, they were evicted from housing because they couldn't keep up with utilities. And people say it was 600 a month. Why couldn't you afford it? Well, I'm only on Social Security. I only get 300 a month. I need to eat off that, sleep off that, transportation. We just don't have the funds to maintain housing. So I've always preached this. I stand behind that. We need a job and we need our brothers and sisters in the LGBT community, our cis brothers and sisters. We need employment. And we, you know, if we're doing the job, we need to have the right to advance into management. Uh, most of my brothers and sisters are not managers and directors at these nonprofits. There are like 10 uh, trans women who are directors um, out of about 100 that I know uh, in San Fran Francisco who are just managers and directors. There are very few CEOs who are trans-led. Um, and that's what I, I think we're missing. You can't have housing without a job 
You can't have job without financial security. A job brings 401k. It brings financial security. It brings vacation. When you're sick, it gives you health care. That is what I think we need. That's what I'm requesting from my allies, both straight and gay, and especially in the LGBT community. We could do more. You can do more to help our allies and just step up. Ooh. Let's just take a moment for that word. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I'm in church right now. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Tony. I really appreciate that. Um, the There's a, a level of accountability uh, across all of the organizations, clinicians, um, you know, developers that might be, uh, you know, witnessing this this conversation right now. There is a level of accountability we all have to reflect on, um, and you know, across the across the board, nonprofits are struggling with acquiring, um, you know, diverse talent, and so we really need to examine what is it about our processes that we are that we've been implementing that are clearly failing. So we need to be more creative, and creativity is the most important uh, aspect of making sure that we're holding ourselves accountable. And I, so, I just appreciate that word, Ms. Tony. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Labiosa, you're next. Um, ooh, I just lost my place and I'm back. Dr. Labiosa, our next question is to you. Your impressive work has led to monumental change through your dedication to public health for the LGBTQ plus community. Simultaneously, you have a unique lens to the elder queer community in Puerto Rico. How do you, uh, the needs of the elder, elder LGBTQ plus community differ than those in the rest of the, uh, the, the elders in the rest of the states? And how are they similar? And what are the creative ways that you have sought to address them? Dr. Labiosa. Thank you. Um, a very important question. And I'm going to clarify for everybody who is um, with us today. Puerto Rico is part of the United States. So let me clarify that. And we are US citizens. Let me clarify that. And although until now we have been um, treated as third class citizens or um, as a downsized citizen of the United States, we are not. So um, that question is very complex because it has a political structure behind it that has brought us to where we are at right now. And for the treatment that we have been receiving from the U.S. government on the past administration and the current administration that hasn't stepped up to make us or help us come to a place that we can all be at the same level or at the same playing field. Um, the differences um, in our LGBT older adult are, are significant. The first significant difference is that suicide attempts and death by suicides are larger found in the older community rather than in the states that is in the younger community. Bullying and social isolation is impacting our older adults here in Puerto Rico, and more if you're an older LGBT individual. The second thing is emergency rooms are being utilized, not so much for COVID, but more because of the mental health impact that our older LGBT adult has lived, not only by this pandemic of COVID, but by the history of the pandemia held by HIV. We, this is a more complex situation that we're living in today adding to that we just had two huge earth, um, hurricanes in 2017, earthquakes for the last year and a half, and then um, bankruptcy and economical instability for the country for the last 10 years, you can argue. The similarities brings us with the same thing that I just mentioned, the financial stabil instability that we have of our elders. And the transportation, since the hurricanes, many of the transportation routes have been um, deleted or taken away because there's not that many young individuals going to um, work because more um, this country, this um, Puerto Rico is more older than young since the hurricane. So we're becoming a more older society. The isolation, the social isolation is found not only in the suburban areas, but also in the urban areas of San Juan. There's not that many spaces. We are one of very few um, spaces that we provide to the LGBT older adult that comes from a space of equity and equality and that we treat you with respect, no matter your intersectionalities. That's not found across the island and across even the metro area of San Juan. And going back, um, we find that individuals are going back to a closet in order to be able to go into housing, in able to get their medical needs met, in order for them to receive the care and the food that they 
should get no matter who they are. And we're finding that individuals are going back to a closet in order to be able to meet their needs. Um, we at Ways Ahead and SAGE in Puerto Rico really are trying to provide not only the case management and the mental health needs of the individual, but also provide them social atmosphere that they can come in a very um, safe space. During the pandemic, we have been doing it online and on the phone, but normally we provide yoga, meditation, mindfulness groups, support groups. Um, days come um, here to play games, board games, do puzzles, um, watch movies, etc. We try to give them a wide array of services that they can come to and they can feel at home and meet others like them. Now transportation, we have been using a lot of these services that they themselves cannot afford, but we are providing them so that they can come to this safe space to not only get vaccinated, but also to play and to just um, experience life as an older LGBT adult here in Puerto Rico. Beautiful answer, uh, Dr. Labrigo. So actually a powerful one. And I really appreciate uh, because there is absolutely, um, you know, a social distinction of who Puerto Ricans are and who the rest of the state states are. And that othering absolutely just results into, you know, to violence. Othering always mm -hmm. ends up uh, resulting in violence. And then when you name the similarities around uh, closeting of our seniors, th there's nothing that I find more devastating because the act of coming out or living your truth um, comes with a lot of sacrifice. And for most of us, as painful as it is, it's worth that sacrifice, but to then end up in the closet because as you are aging, you're becoming more vulnerable and, and you wanna access these uh, resources and these services without persecution. It's almost like, what is the point of the loss that was experienced if, if you know, if, if you've lived your whole life to, to fight for that and then to, to have to lose that at the end when you wanna thrive in your aging experience. So I really appreciate that answer, Dr. Uh, Dr. Levioso. Thank you. And we're gonna return back to Michelle. Uh, Michelle, we uh, return to you for another question. In comparison to many of the nonprofit organizations attempting to address the needs of the aging LGBTQ plus community in their own ways, Taja's coalition is unique in its coalition building. So what are the differences in the way the work manifests through that coalition building in a world held rigid by the nonprofit industrial complex? And what can other nonprofits learn from the model Taja's has embodied? Um, thank you, Afram. Yes, that's a very, a, another great question. <laughs> um, so Taja's, um, one of our missions is um, coalition building as well as working cohesively and synergistically with other agencies, um, not only here in San Francisco, but across the Bay Area. Um, one of our beliefs is that having this um, connected network between agencies um, provides more of a social network, I'm sorry, a resource network for our participants to be able to access when we're all working together. So definitely um, that is one of our missions and our model that we work off of. Um, myself being a member of the TAC, the Transgender, um, uh, the Transgender Action Committee here in San Francisco, as well as um, having um, the TCC here at the, so the Taj Coalition, which stands for the, um, the Transgender um, Coordinating Council, which we, what we do is um, we have members from, that sit, on our, that sit on our council, on our committee, that are um, workers in other agencies. They, they, you know, it varies from case managers to, uh, program managers, things of that nature, people who, who interact directly with the community. So we can hear what it is that our community is um, is in need of. What areas are we as community providers? Where are we lacking? What can we do to provide more services? So we, when we have our meetings, when we speak and um, we converse and exchange ideas on how to plug in those holes and fix those problems for our community. As Tony said earlier, you know, um, one of the issues that I have experienced myself um, here in the Bay Area is that there are not a lot of um, women and trans, or I'm sorry, women of trans experience and leadership positions um, here in the Bay Area. I feel as though 
that saying that is now being, you know, really popularized. Um, if you can see her, you can be her, you know, and if you can't see yourself in a position, then there's no way you can, you know, that, that you want to even try to make the strides to get there. Um, I hope that the work that I am doing is, is creating a um, sort of a, something where people can aspire to in a, in a sense, because I don't want to be that type of a person like, oh, I want people to be like me. No. What I want is for people to have the opportunity to see that, yeah, I'm not from the best place in the whole entire United States of America. I'm from Miami, Florida. And if I can do it, you can too. So um, mostly that is um, my particular personal standpoint um, with what it is that we do at the Taj Coalition. Definitely, um, again, working together only strengthens the community at large, especially for those of color. Um, you know, it is extremely unfortunate um, when people fall through the cracks because, you know, one agency, um, I don't know, doesn't like working with another agency, so they won't advise their participants of particular um, programs and services that one agency may have just because they don't want to, you know, they, they, they don't have a good working relationship with each other. Um, coming into community service work here in the Bay Area, that was a behavior and a dynamic that I just could not wrap my, my head around because the way I, I look at it is when we go into this work, we go into this work for a specific purpose and that is to provide services to our community members who don't have access. And it, there should not be these overarching things of ego and um, acknowledgement, because those things are not important. What is important is servicing our community, providing them with foundational um, support that is going to be transitional and transferable, meaning something that's going to help them change their lives as well as be able to propel themselves and their community forward by sharing their experiences and you know, their lived experiences with life and going from where they started to where they are in their current lives and showing that pro that progression, showing that it's not easy, but is attainable and it can be done just with a little bit of hard work and determination. Um, one of, so one of the aspects of us and our programming at the Taja Coalition is building um, that foundational structure for our participants, meaning um, if you are having issues around education, I direct you to places where you could, you know, get your, you know, get your GED classes, places that are closest to you, focus you on um, what you want your life to look like in the future. And then, you know, basically trying to help you guide um, yourself essentially to a better path. Um, I, we feel as though attacking those particular issues is what's most, um, what's going to be the, bring the most fundamental change for an individual person. Now, when you're talking about people who are um, over 50, right? Um, if you're a woman of trans experience of color and you spent most of your life, um, you know, doing various things, discovering yourself, who cares? I don't, because what is that? This, this is where you are at this point. You, your housing is unstable. You don't have any idea of what financial literacy is and how to um, how to use it to better your 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 current situation and plan for your future. You want help in um, obtaining. Um, skills to go into the workforce. What we do is we try to hone in on those and provide you with a way so that you could help yourself. If you're 50 and you're starting this out, you know, you're gonna, you have a couple of years um, to, to catch up, but it's still attainable. Um, that's basically our, my, um, my idea of what it is that we can do as service providers um, and across, you know, across the board, not just for, um, community serving the LGBTQIA um, community, but for all um, service providers, instead of focusing on um, numbers and, you know, writing grants and things of that nature, we should focus more on providing services that are going to actually help people have equitable lives. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Beautiful answer. That's actually the first time I uh, heard that quote. If you see her, you can be her. And it's extremely powerful. I mean, if I'm walking into a room, it's it's my natural inclination to look, scan around and see if I'm if I can see myself reflected back. It's just it's just the way it works. And so I I really love um, I just love that quote. I've never heard it. I, it sounds like it's becoming popular, but that's really, really powerful. And so much about Taj's model. We all have a lot to learn uh, from that model and that collaboration. You know, it's just really, really important that we also embody that. And we have to learn from the community that's on the ground doing the work every day. So I'm so, so appreciative of all of the work that you're doing at Taj's and, and for your answer. So thank you so much. Dr. Sullivan. This next question is for you. Open House began their work as a housing organization and over the last two decades, expanded their services to better serve the LGBTQ plus community in San Francisco. Can you touch on the unique partnership we have developed with Unlock to continue our mission in, in keeping our elders aging at home and through both the new Open House and Unlock Community Day services and Unlock's PACE program and what we are doing to ensure Open House providers um, get these programs equitably? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, <clears throat> uh, Ephraim. So I will just say one thing, you know, Open House always uh, envisioned itself first as a housing organization. I mean, that was really the, um, the vision that Marcy Edelman, our founder, had. Um, but because housing takes so long, um, we really initially started in terms of, um, you know, taking action about creating services for LGBTQ older adults. And there really wasn't a lot um, in, in San Francisco when this organization started back in 1998. Um, yeah, the partnership with Onlock, um, I think is very special. Uh, I think it's new and you obviously Ephraim have uh, really done an enormous amount to create this partnership and to ensure that it is healthy and serving the community. I think, I just will wind back a little bit because you said it so quickly, which is, you know, we want to keep people, you know, in their community, in their homes. And I think that there have been a lot of organizations um, who have looked to develop housing for LGBTQ older adults, and which is great. Um, you know, I did that when I was in Los Angeles. Um, I was working on that in Seattle here, of course, in San Francisco. And there's just a lot of great momentum in a lot of different places around the country to develop this type of housing. What we have been less good at is what do we do after that person is in their home? The home is important for sure. Um, and I think both Michelle and um, Tony have talked about this a little bit that you, know, you have to ensure that someone can remain in their home, um, but then also there needs to be support in that environment so people can really, um, fulfill their promise, whatever their personal um, promise is, what is the thing that they want to achieve in their life? And so part of this partnership with Onlock is to create systems and program that is, um, is really supportive of helping our community members age in place and age successfully. And, you know, as a gerontologist, there was a lot of fight around the word success and successfully many years ago. And what it means to me is each individual person defines their own success. What does it mean to them um, to age successfully? And then what uh, can we do as a nonprofit to actually support them in that quest to their successful aging? And it's really about optimizing um, the lived experience and, you know, we need to do this at all ages, um, not just, you know, 50 plus, but um, that's what we're focused on here at at, um, at Open House. So talking about the partnership, sorry, getting to the question that you actually asked me. Um, you know, the partnership is unique and Unlock, I think, is a unique partner um, because they have really recognized what are the areas that they needed help with? They needed to do a deep, and they did, self-assessment about where the organization, um, where their organization was at in terms of serving LGBTQ older adults. And that's really what started um, what started this, this program um, uh, and started the training program in particular. Um, with Unlock, and really, it's been a multi-year um, program of training. 
I, I don't even remember how many hours of training there have been and there will continue to be with OnLock staff because they want to be completely enmeshed in providing the most um, high level of services for LGBTQ older adults in the greater San Francisco Bay Area. The two programs we're, um, we're working on, one is PACE, and PACE stands for um, Program for All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. OnLock actually created that program just over 50 years ago, and it's been um, it's been mimicked um, across the United States and in Canada. And I'm not sure, actually. I will have to check to see if there are PACE programs in um, in Puerto Rico, I'm not sure about that. But um, PACE is a capitated model of service, so it's all inclusive. You get all of your medical care um, at your the PACE that you're a member of. And so um, this program itself, you know, it's for people who would otherwise um, have to move out of community and in, into a nursing home. And so we're trying to keep our community in um, in their homes, in their apartments, in their home for as long as possible. And so this partnership with Unlock really helps us to do that. Um, the other program that we have is the CDS, which has just opened. Um, it's at 75 Laguna. Um, you can contact myself or Ephraim if you wanna know more, if you wanna have more information about it. Um, the CDS is um, a program that really allows for, <coughs> excuse me, um, Folks who might have a little bit higher acuity might need some help with activities of daily living to be um, supported and to have their caregivers supported. So the program is Tuesday through Saturday. Um, it uh, is from 11 to 3 o'clock. Uh, so we serve meals at this program. We provide transportation. So if someone can't get to 75 Laguna, transportation is then provided for them through this program. Um, and then we have appropriate activities um, and the things that are LGBTQ affirming um, in terms of activities. We have caregivers that are on site. So it really, it provides um, really a comprehensive wraparound uh, suite of services for LGBTQ older adults that are in, um, in our community and also provides respite. We have partners who are dropping um, their uh, loved one off at the CDS and that partner then gets a little bit of respite, can go out and have a cup of coffee, go home, take a nap, go out, do the shopping, whatever it may be. Um, it's just an incredible uh, partnership and service that we're able to provide um, uh, to LGBT older adults. And like I said, if you're interested, um, definitely get in touch with us. I think the other thing I would say is, you know, Unlock really realized that it was going to be a stronger program if it was housed at open house. LGBTQ older adults that are part of the open house family and everybody's welcome. So please join us. Um, you know, they feel more comfortable here. The barriers of entry are lower because the program is at open house and all of the eligibility is done with open house staff. And so people coming here, enjoying the new um, activity center at 75 Laguna, it creates um, really a sense of comfort. And sometimes our community, um, you know, we, we self-isolate because we don't think that we'll be safe in an environment, in a nursing home or in another uh, senior center. This is housed here. Um, our community members know they'll be safe, they'll be respected, they can be their whole person um, at our location and, you know, we're just very grateful for the partnership with Unlock and for them allowing us really to take the lead on training their staff and not just the staff here, but the staff throughout the city um, because they're looking to really become um, a partner with the LGBT community no matter where people live in the city so that one day we will feel comfortable going to multiple sites throughout the city as well. Um, so it's a great partnership. I'm very grateful for the work you've done Ephraim to actually bring it um, to fruition for our community members. And, you know, a year from now, we're going to know a lot more. As I said, it just opened, um, but we're already learning a lot about sort of providing this deep level of care and service to, um, to our community. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Dr. Sullivan. I, uh, I couldn't agree more. I think, <clears throat> 
you know, a partnership with Unlock, why it's so unique, like, like you had mentioned, I just want to touch on again, is that demonstrated, you know, deep desire to actually shift culturally, because so often when these nonprofits are going in and providing these trainings of cultural competency, it's extremely superficial. It's very, you know, surface level, it's to tick off, you know, whatever inclusive DEI, um, you know, the objectives that they might have, but that there was this exactly as you said, multi-year commitment uh, that is now uh, manifesting itself in both the adult day program and pace being uh, brought to our community. So thank you so much for that well thought out, uh, answer, Dr. Sullivan. Sure. Um, and Miss Tony Newman, I'm coming to you next. Oftentimes, the elder trans narrative is spoken through the lens of trauma and suffering many uh, have been subjected to throughout their lives. And while this you know, conversation must and should continue, it's not the only narrative. And so I would love for you to speak to ways that your work has led to uplifting and empowering elder trans community members to excel both in the workforce uh, and simultaneously uh, educating their organizations in the ways that they work uh, into fostering an environment where they can actually thrive. Thank you, Ephraim. Um, you know, I, I always read and, and about the negativity of being a trans woman of color. You always see the, the, the they're not getting housing. You know, we have high numbers of, of being killed in America. People are not getting prosecuted. And, you know, that is very sad. And, and I send my blessings to their families and to those. But I, 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 I love to talk about the accomplishments that we are trying to do to uplift the trans community. Um, you know, we had started with the Trans Office of Initiatives um, years ago, I think three years ago with Mayor Breed, Claire Farley, and we came up with the, um, the, the $2 million for trans housing, which sits with Todgers, which sits with St. James, um, and we begin to house and provide wraparound services uh, to those individuals, therapy, uh, resume building, job, financial security, so, you know, I, I, I love to hear about the positivity because a lot of the time people who hear things about trans women of color, black and brown is always negative um, in, in the negative statement. So in my experience, I started out at my tree um, helping um, um, people with HIV who were really sick. Uh, we started bringing trans folk into that fold. And now that uh, uh, they are beginning to work and do wraparound services for trans folk, um, something they've never done before, help with surgeries, help with other things. We even had one to have a surgery, um, get the surgery, uh, got full recovery. Uh, and my tree was able to help her with that. She is now a coordinator at PRC, doing quite well, applying for a manager role. So that is a positive thing. She was homeless. She was financially broke, but now she's on her feet. She's living her authentic life and making money, has a 401k, has her own apartment. So that is a proud statement. And I wish we could have more of that. San Francisco is a leader, though. I'm in L.A. now, um, about to take over at the Black AIDS Institute. The trans community here is not thriving as well as the trans community in San Francisco. San Francisco is funding at a much higher level through Mayor, Mayor Breed, kudos to her. Uh, Mayor Garcetti, not so much. Are we getting the funding that is needed for housing? Um, and that's why I took over Trans Can Work as chair of the board. Uh, we have a thousand trans people looking for jobs and every week 50 to 60 are getting jobs. With IT, um, with development, uh, nonprofit, chefs, cooking, engineering. And that to me is amazing. I believe the trans community needs employment. Employment leads to financial security. That is the only way you can thrive in America in this capitalist society is have a job, make some money and be able to pay your bills. That is the only way. This is America and we're a capitalist society. So I'm uplifting those trans uh, black and brown folk who are striving who are uh, enlightening and educating and able to live comfortably. I feel very blessed and very fortunate to be able to live comfortably where I'm not worried about where my next meal is coming from and my rent is getting paid. That is not the narrative of my community. 85% of my community are still suffering. That's why I'm here in the work and I'll do the work until I die, until I have no air in my body to uplift those trans women, black and brown of color, and I'm and, and white as well. I'm I'm for trans everybody. 
but the trans folk of color are at the bottom. I love my white brothers and sisters who are trans. I love my black uh, sisters and brothers who are trans, but my white brothers and sisters seem to be able to maneuver um, the working environment, the financial environment. They have more family connections. Um, um, most of the trans community of color have no family relations. They've been exiled. There's a communication problem. They didn't come from a family who can send them money. There was no money to send. They're economically living in poverty. So we, we have a longer journey, but I'm uplifting those that get housing, get a job and get financial security. Uh, and that's why I'm here in this work. Period. I really have nothing to add to that. Um, I so appreciate uh, this dedication to that work. And it's, it's funny how much we, in all of our work, are constantly theorizing about ways that we can support this community when it's so obvious that it's the literal tangible, um, you know, literally money into the hands of of uh, black and brown and, and white trans uh, individuals. And so like the ways to get there, it is, tangible physical things that they need. And so oftentimes we just get up into the clouds when we really need to get these fundamental things. There's a hierarchy of needs. We are all familiar with that. So I really appreciate that on, that, that answer, Tony. Uh, Dr. Labios, I'm coming to you next. A huge part of your work through Sage uh, Puerto Rico is in the partnership with Waves Ahead uh, Corporation, of which you are the CEO. Outside of the similar struggle, struggles that LGBTQ people, um, or excuse me, elders experience, how have the significant economical barriers and climate disasters, and I know you spoke to this a little bit earlier, uh, impacted the aging queer community in Puerto Rico? And as you begin plans to build the first LGBTQ plus centered housing for elders, what do you need from the broader LGBTQ community in the States to support your efforts? Thank you um, for that question. And I'm going to continue on the same line that Tony mentioned. Um, she mentioned about the exile um, that is happening here. And it happens in continental US. It happens all around the world among our LGBT elders, specifically those who look different or that experience different intersectionalities from physical or cognitive impairments to mental health issues to being transgender. The impact of all of those, and I have, as I mentioned it before, um, really has impacted mental health, um, has impacted our month to month. Many of our elders live day to day. Um, we just completed a needs assessment on those elders who live with HIV and AIDS, um, who are 50 plus, never, in the con never has been done here in the country. And we did it um, earlier this year. We found out two main things, and Tony mentioned it, I think everybody, all the co-panelists here have mentioned it. One is that two out of every five individuals did not have enough to eat on that day. That was very impactful for me, that two out of every five individuals living with HIV AIDS who are already, in a sense, veterans of this, still don't have something to eat that day here in Puerto Rico. And the second thing that impacted me the most is that four out of five individuals did not have a permanent housing unit that they can call their own, that they are rooming with someone else, that they are couch surfing. And those are things that we have heard before among our youth, but here in Puerto Rico to see it on our elders is very um, sad and impactful. Yes, we're working to establish this housing um, unit, but as um, Michelle said, it takes time. Um, it, it just takes time. We are rushing through it and we did have the hurricanes that were very impactful, but that has helped us be able to process these housing units quicker than if we didn't have those hurricanes. So we're using that negative to turn it into a positive because there has been some aid coming to Puerto Rico, not as much as we expected or that we should expect soon, but with what little money we have, we are developing those housing units in a town that is very gay friendly and that it has all the, all the services needed. Um, the gathering of other people of, you know, COVID has really impacted that. So a lot of our elders continue feeling isolated. We are continuing um, educating about taking away the stigma that we have our mental health, treating it as a main part of our bodies um, to prevent mental health issues. So that way you can take care of everyday business. As you all know, 
if we don't take care of our mental health, we don't know what to do next. So it is important for us to address mental health as a preventive issue that impacts our body health, our full health. And what can the broader community do? Really listen and learn. Um, listen about and learn about our intersectionalities. We might be part of those letters of LGBT, but we are more than just those letters. We are more than those boxes that they want to compress us into fitting into the little boxes. Yes, we can see that these boxes are because of this um, stage that we have tonight, um, today that we have to fit in these boxes, but we are more than these boxes. Um, and we need to learn about that and surpass about that issue that we have, that all Boricuas are broke or that all the Bo Puerto Ricans are you know, scrambling. We have a lot of success stories. We have among us heroes and heroines that have really marked the difference in the LGBT community in the States and here in Puerto Rico as well. So we need to educate others about our differences and about our similarities. And that way we can really increase ourselves and increase our spirits so then we can continue the work ahead. We need to work as a community. We're not isolated. LGBT is not an isolation. It's something that unites us. So we need to use it for our advantage in order to make a difference in any of the spaces that we live in. It could be in Puerto Rico, it could be in San Francisco, it could be anywhere around the world. But we need to really come together and be able to listen and learn from our differences as well as our similarities. Amazing, uh, Dr. Labiosa, thank you so much for that answer. I'm still trying to digest that astronomical statistic of four out of five of these seniors are, are don't have you know stable housing. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really unacceptable. And re, uh, I want to kind of just very quickly touch back to what you had said earlier, uh, I think during the first round of questions, th that this current administration and the, and the last administration, at this point, the complacency is so violent. It's, there, there has to be a sense of urgency in maintaining and, co and, and, and connecting Puerto Rico into, into making sure that, you know, that, that these needs are being addressed. Um, so, I mean, congratulations on, on the building of the housing. I appreciate that you're taking that negative into, into a positive. And I know, uh, you know, we, look, we just look forward to, to what that does for, that, for the community there. And Efren, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, you know, I know that in the States, you have all heard that there are billions and trillions of dollars coming to Puerto Rico. Only less than 4% of that money has arrived to Puerto Rico, even after four years after the hurricanes, Irma and Maria. So also do not learn from the so-called news. Come to us, contact us in Puerto Rico so we can give you the right voice that we're trying to speak out. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lavioso. So we're gonna go uh, through our last round uh, of questions, but before I do that, I just wanna let the audience know that there will be a Q&A section here at the end. So I want you to you know, prepare and ruminate on what it is that, you know, in the deep crevices of your mind that you wanna ask these you know, fabulous uh, speakers. And so we'll, we'll address that here at the end of this next round. So I just wanted to put that out into the ether so that uh, folks that wanna ask questions are prepared. So for this last round of questions, uh, it's actually the same question that's gonna be asked to each individual, uh, each individual speaker here. And so as we close this you know, incredible conversation, I wanna circle back to the original question of this panel. And the question uh, will be answered by each of you. And it is from your observations and despite everything we are uh, getting right, what are we missing in helping every LGBTQ plus elder thrive? And Michelle, we're gonna go ahead and start with you. Thank you so much, Ephraim. Um, I wanna say, returning back to the Bay Area um, for the, as of the, the last three years, three, almost four years now, um, and working in community services, one of the things that has been the most fundamental need for the elderly members of the LGBTQIA community at large is connectivity. You know, especially during this pandemic, we have people who um, have gone through so many life changes over the decades. You know, they were advocates for the things that we have and take advantage of today. They, you know, marched, they, you know, cried, they went through so many different things. And now, 
that they're at the, you know, at this point in their lives, you know, living through all of that, you know, you lose people, you know, um, as time goes on and you form, con you know, you form connections with people, you lose those connections, people pass away, people move away. Um, and then you're just sitting one day and you're all alone and there's nobody there, but you, and if you're lucky enough to have, housing, you know, which is the most fundamental thing, right? If every one of us should be able to have, we all should have a place to live. None of us should be exposed to the elements, especially when you are, when you are elderly. Um, I was lucky enough to watch my great grandmother live to 98 years old. You know what I mean? And one of the things that she, that she told me, which I hold deep to myself now is that <laughs> have children so they can take care of you. <laughs> she used to, to say this to me all the time. And I would be like, you know, well, I don't know how that's going to happen, grandma, because, you know, but I, but I am actually, this is, I'm not doing this because I want to start, a, you know, I'm not starting a family because I want somebody to take care of me when I get older. I want to be able to, you know, have the opportunity to raise children myself. My um, my partner and I are getting married very soon and we want to start a family. So, you know, those things are um, important for me because I know that these are things I want to build for myself and my family moving forward. But, you know, a lot of um, a lot of our siblings, especially the older ones, ne you know, never really even thought of that as an opportunity or as something that they could even strive to having. Um, so, you know, and they, and also speaking about, um, touching on the other panelists, um, they were speaking earlier about being exiled from your families and communities when you go, th especially when you are a person who is, um, who is in the transgender community, um, be it, um, male or, you know, trans male or trans female, we all have similar experiences where we get shunned by people um, who don't feel as though we fit into what their category of normal is, you know, be it um, total exhalation or just, you know, they're not giving as much care to you as an individual person as they should, you know, and then you go through your life being independent and strong and taking care of yourself and only worrying about your own survival. And then, you know, like I said before, when you get to a certain age and you're, you know, you're, you're, you turn around and, you know, there's nobody there. Um, so what we need to do as community members is we need to be that family for our elderly in our community who don't have family grandchildren, children, nieces, nephews to come and look after them, call them up on the phone. How are you doing today? Can I bring you some groceries? You know what I mean? I feel as though if we, if we hold that as a fundamental mission for ourselves to not only, for our community to not only take care of our younger generation who is going to be moving forward to to basically restructurizing what our community looks like, but also take care of the ones who've already been there and now are at the end of, you know, their amazing journeys. And they need somebody to come and hold their hand and let them sit on their bosom for a little while while they, you know, saying sit there and cry and talk about the old days or whatever. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that, yes, um, we focus attention on our overall community, but we do need to give special care to the elderly in our community because they don't have, um, you know, sometimes they just don't have people and that's what they need. They want connection with people. They want to be able to talk, have somebody, you know, know how they're doing, even if they're doing okay. You know, that's a part of mental health, um, human connectivity. And I think we, that's one of the things that we should, we should keep um, or we should walk away from this conversation with is not only making sure that we grow and strengthen our community, but that the ones who were, who put in that blood, sweat and tears to get us where we are today, that we give them their roses while they're still here and give them the acknowledgements that they deserve and, you know, and uh, keep it fresh, keep it light, you know? <laughs> Thank you so much. Love that, love that, uh, Michelle. Absolutely, that connection, even like, as you said, even if it's just, even if they're doing okay, it's about being seen. It's not just about that simple ask, are you okay? It's being seen. And obviously, as we know, as we age, 
the more invisible the society wants to make you. So it is life or death, literally, to be seen. So I really appreciate that answer. Uh, for the rest of the panelists, I'm realizing we're having this amazing conversation and we're pushing up close to the Q&A. So if you'd, uh, I'm gonna move to Dr. Sullivan next, if we don't mind trying to condense our answers to about two minutes, um, just so that we can have the audience offer up um, whatever questions that they might have. So Dr. Sullivan, please. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I think Michelle really um, said a lot of great things and, you know, there's probably not a ton to say on top of that, except I do think that it's important just to note that, you know, we're one of the wealthiest societies in the world. What are we doing not giving Puerto Rico all the money it needs to rebuild? Why don't we house tra every transgender senior in the Tenderloin instead of building a brand new upscale um hotel why are we still struggling to reduce food insecurity for everyone in our community and for all communities i mean the economic impact of poverty in this country is astonishing to so many communities and it doesn't need to be that way we can spend billions of dollars in all kinds of ways but we won't spend it on supporting people and unless we do that we won't have the housing and it will be harder and harder for nonprofit groups to make ends meet. I think the only other thing I'd say is, you know, we have this living mural to people who are long-term survivors of HIV. And up in the right-hand corner, there's a little character who's behind a closed door, who's scared and alone. And that's the one person we haven't reached out to yet. And I think, you know, as communities that and people who are working in uh, social services, I think we have to constantly think creatively about how do we reach out to the people who haven't come through their door, our door yet? Why haven't they? they don't, maybe they don't feel comfortable. Whatever their reason is, how is it that we can bring maybe services to them so that they then can take that next step of connecting with others? Beautiful. Why, why, why? No one can answer. I really appreciate that answer, Dr. Sullivan. Great. And Tony, to you. My answer, is, my answer is short. I agree with both <laughs> my colleagues here. And let's focus on the mental health um, um, who are depressed. When you are senior, I visited a few here and there. They've been very depressed. You know, they're in their apartment. They're talking to no one. They have no partner. They have no family. Um, and they're feeling very lonely. So as, as Michelle said, let's reach out and show some love because depression is real. Uh, when you're sitting in an apartment, um, you know, you're barely making it, but you're making it. It's real. Um, and I think mental health and depression are, are something that we should pay more close attention to. Uh, and that's it for me. Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. And Dr. Labiosa, last but not least, what are we missing? I'm going to add to everyone who has just said the, my three co-presenters have said it eloquently, and I'm just going to add to all of them, Dito, Dito, Dito. And also, um, let's celebrate our, our intersectionalities and learn from each other. We can learn from so much from each other. I learned from so many, not because of age, just because of who we are. And we're so different. That's what makes us unique. We cannot assume. Let's just take that out from our language and our thoughts. Assumptions are so bad, and it doesn't lead to anything positive. So dito, 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 and let's learn from each other and really make those intersectionalities celebrate and be celebrated every day of our lives. Thank you so much, Dr. Labiosa. Just, I'm just like ruminating in this conversation. I'm just so blessed uh, from all of the perspectives that I'm hearing here. Uh, so thank you so much to our panelists, your dedication and significant contributions to the aging LGBTQ plus community does not go unnoticed. And I so appreciate the honest, you know, intentional conversation that this panel has offered. Uh, so we're gonna move to our Q&A segment. And so those in the audience, like I mentioned before, you are welcome to type uh, if you'll notice on the right side of your uh, of the of the window of the video, you'll be able to type into the um, 
chat. Um, so please, we welcome your questions. Uh, and you know, it would be helpful as you ask those questions, just indicate uh, if there's a specific person that you would like to, to answer that question, what the, what the question is, and we can get started. Um, so, all right, let's go ahead and get into questions. So I'm seeing a few pop up here. I have a question from Mark. Uh, specifically responding to Dr. Sullivan, given the, cru uh, the crucial and immediate need of structure and support for community, could it be developed first given the uh, long time required to create housing? I'm wondering if this is a part of the conversation. Uh, a question from Robert L. Bettinger, uh, who is a doctor, as a resident of a low, oh, excuse me, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so it's, let me, uh, uh, ask that question one more time. Given the crucial and immediate need of structure and support for community, could it be developed first given the long time required to create housing? Essentially, like what are the bureaucratic barriers and why does it take this long? So, I, you know, yes, <laughs> start developing community first. Um, you're gonna need to, if you're, you know, an organization or um, uh, maybe you're just a community group or a group of friends that are getting together to look at developing housing, absolutely develop community first um, because you're going to need to include community in the development in what you're actually looking to accomplish with what we would call in urban studies the built environment that's the structure the building um, but it's incredibly important to you know not put the fact that that built environment is not completed yet as a barrier to you actually creating community. And I'll just give you an, an example. I was working with um, the Rainbow Mamas, who are a group of mothers in Beijing and Shanghai, China, who are very worried about their children, um, their LGBTQ children, because they um, aren't going to have kids or assume that they their children aren't going to have kids. They're not going to have someone to take care of them. And so they started um, working and creating um, what was China P flag and is China P flag mm -hmm. as a way to connect the parents and then also their kids um, into a community. So there's mutual support and, you know, almost everything they do is illegal in China, but they still are able to do it. They're still able to create these connections. So absolutely, Mark, create those community groups first. That's what Open House had to do. You know, we started in 1998. We didn't open our doors for our first housing development, 55 Laguna until about um, six, seven years ago. Thank you so much, Dr. Sullivan. A really inform, um, informing answer. Um, we have a question from Dr. Bettinger in the in the uh, audience. As a resident of a low cost SR residence of 100 plus people, how can we build into management's responsibility to include provisions for seniors communicating, uh, like seeing and hearing issues, and also training staff, including maintenance, to help on that communication? And this is a general question to anyone in the audience if they want to take that. Well, I'll take I'll take a swipe at it. I don't want to take sure. it. So if someone else raise their hand and I'll stop. But, um, you know, this is such a great question, Robert. Um, so thank you for asking it. And, you know, we we continually um, and I say we nonprofits that work in housing um, oftentimes um, come up against the challenge of working with property management because their job is always to enforce the lease and to make sure that rent is on time, et cetera. And as the service side, our job is to keep people housed, to bring you know resources into that person's life that they might need, whether it's food or social support. There's been a lot of talk about mental health. I think that um, you know the only thing that I've really seen work is to create, and this goes back to something that you know Michelle said earlier, create a coalition with a property management company and connect them. Basically, they need to be connected to services. They need to be connected to service groups that can help train them on how to work more competently with older adults. I know Enterprise Community Partners down in Los Angeles has done great trainings working with property management companies. I'm not sure if that's the same here in San Francisco. Um, or you can work with any of the organizations that um, are on this panel. Ephraim, for instance, really leads up the training and transformation program um, as part of his department at Open House. And we're always happy to um, really sit down with residents and, and with property managers and see what can we do to actually create a more uh, supportive housing environment. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Sullivan. And I know, uh, Michelle, this this question pertains to a lot of the work that you do as well. So if, if you want to expand um, on, on that question, that'd be great too. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, um, Ephraim, for, um, for coming to me. Yeah, um, when it comes to uh, people who are um, who are residents in shared living spaces, like um, homes for elderly people, uh, uh, single room occupancy, um, resident um, management types of situations, things where a lot of people live together that are managed by larger entities, right? Um, I believe that one thing will be that will be able to help. Um, I guess kind of like satiate this issue. One, having across the board um, unilateral change to how we collect um, the data and information of these people who are living in these um, in these places. You know, if you if you have an indicator or something that shows, you know, what community you lie in, how you um, how you present yourself, and things of that nature, it will make it a little bit more of an easier experience for those who are elderly who are living in these particular environments from the LGBTQIA plus community. Also, um, I wanted to touch on the previous question from Mark um, about the um, need for structure and support of community, especially when it comes to um, having adequate places to house people. I feel as though local government should get directly involved, not with um, community-based organizations, but people who own property in, for example, the San Francisco area who use, um, I want to call them um, verification tactics that, are, that create barriers for people to not have access to things like equitable housing, credit checks, you know, income, uh, for, uh, what's another one? Um, rental status if you are if you are a black woman of trans experience and you're 57 years old 60 years old and you know you've been getting through life the best way you can your credit's not that great you receive social security but you have an agency that's willing to help you but then you have all of these you know all of the applications that you fill out they keep you keep being denied for housing even to those that are specifically designed for people from your community to take advantage of but because you don't meet one of these aspects of criteria you are still denied and you're still in the same position i i feel as though if we get if we if we go to local government and in, and have them enforce actual you know um places for people to live like if you if you have if you're a, a large residential company and you own 50 buildings in san francisco and only one of them or in in the combined space that you have you have maybe less than 50 um residents that, that identify with the lgbtqia community or especially the trans community at large um then you should have like to pay a penalty or you should have to raise um that amount and you they should, you they should be obligated you should feel obligated to help people in their community or help people in this community be able to live more equitable lives. Instead of pushing people out, a lot of these tactics are used to, you know, it's not a, it's not so much really and truly when you really get down to the brass taxes of it all. It's not so much about um, identity, it's about income, how much money you have, how much money you have the ability to make. And that is what is becoming the great divider in our country. Um, and in our smaller communities also, you know, we are separating ourselves more and more every day by the haves and the have nots, even in the transgender community. Um, and I feel as though it is our responsibility to close those gaps um, across the board. Um, and yeah, I think that's, yeah, that, that pretty much um, sums up what it was that I wanted to address. But thank you so much, um, Ephraim, for coming to me. Yes, absolutely, Michelle. No, thank you so much. Uh, you're, you have a, um, a level of expertise specifically with that, that I really appreciate your input. Thank you so much. Uh, and Dr. Labiosa, this one's for you from Beth in the audience. How can I help someone that feels alone to feel more connected? Thank you for that question. Um, we at Sage and all of the affiliates have a program. Um, it's called Sage Connects, and we connect individuals with um, older adults and with any individual who wants to connect with folks 
um, by phone, by visits, home visits, depending on where you are located. We in Puerto Rico always are connecting individuals with um, folks here in the island, as also from continental US and in other parts of Latin America, so that they know that they're not alone. So there's options. I would invite you to go to sageusa.org for more information about this program and the details. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for your answer, Dr. Leviosa. Uh, so we only have a few minutes left. So this is going to be our last question from the audience. And this question is, did I lose it? Oh, it's right here. From Lynette. And this is going to go to you, Ms. Tony Newman. What are some of the critical changes that we all need to make in order for us to live among each other and together with one another in order for us all to be able to live the American dream to come uh, uh, to say, to the same degree as everyone would like to. Um, one word for me that says respect. If we could just respect one another, you don't have to agree with the transitions that I've made in my life or others have done to their life or my body confirmations or contortions that I've done, but just respect me as a human being made by God. And I respect you as a human being made by God. If we could do that, just respect one another and forget the LGBTQIAA. I'm a human being. You a human being, whether I identify as gay, straight, bi, trans, whatever. We're just human beings trying to live a happy, productive life. So if you could just show respect and love to those that you meet who may be less fortunate than you, I think that's all that we're required to do as human beings, to respect one another and leave the judgment home. Let's not judge each other because we don't agree with what so-and-so has done or who they are. Just get rid of that and just be respectful. And I'm, I say that to my community uh, as well. In order to get love, you must give love. So if you want respect, you've got to give respect. I say that to all of my trans brothers and sisters. I hear you, but did you give love back? So you gave no love, they gave no love, and you're in a, in a disagreement. So let's try to be respectful of one another. I say that in North Carolina all the time. When I go home, I'm not asking you to, to believe in what I've done. You don't need to judge me. That's for God to do. Just respect me and I'll do the same for you and we'll get along just fine. Another word, another word from Ms. Tony Newman. <laughs> um, I so appreciate that answer and, and you're so right. I mean, it is life or death, that that level of respect. And it's, it's, it's very easy for us to understand what is important to us as we navigate our realities. We're at the center of our own universes. So it's very easy to understand what's important to me, but it's you know, trying to understand what's important to the other in person and, and um, blending those two things together, that's so important. And that doesn't mean you have to compromise on anything that you believe. It's just recognizing that this person is a human being and they are deserving of life and, you know, be, and, and being able to thrive. So I so appreciate that answer, uh, Ms. Tony. So that, and our Q&A, all right, community. Um, so thank you to our audience members who provided their thoughts and questions. And please join me in thanking our incredible panel for bringing their whole selves to this conversation. We will now take a short break and we're going to reconvene at 12.40 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. That would be 1, 2, 3, 40 uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern Standard Time. And when we return, we will be graced with three individual stories of strength and resilience from the very community that we serve. So make sure you stay tuned and you don't want to miss it. Thank you. Okay. I love these beats, whoever picked them. Welcome back, friends. I am still digesting and reflecting on that absolutely incredible conversation uh, we just shared during the first half of our program. But I am just as thrilled to offer connection through the stories of our elders. These three women are resilient activists and members of our community whose stories illustrate the symbiotic relationship between past and present. We so often you know, assume that our work is in service to these community, uh, community members, yet we forget that it is because of their initial investment of service that we are all here. So first up, I would love to introduce Ms. Patty Ann Hall. Ms. Patty Ann is a long and cared for member of our community who was born in Wisconsin, but moved to the Bay Area in 1981. 
Patty Ann is currently an open house ambassador, assisting in outreach to other organizations and community members. Patty Ann dedicated the majority of her career life helping people of all abilities, working at the Pomeroy Re uh, Recreation and Rehabilitation Center for 20 years six years. Miss Patty Ann's visibility as a Black, intersex, gender, non-conforming trans woman is vital as her experience is unique. At 73, Patty Ann remains a vibrant member of this community and has been featured on several panels sharing her unique experiences. Welcome to the stage, Miss Patty Ann Hall. Hello. Hey. Hi, sweetheart. Hi. Welcome, Hi. welcome. So good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you too. Always yeah. good to see you. Always good to see you. Absolutely. Fantastic. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in if that's okay with you. Yes. Fine. Okay. And if you want to lean a little bit forward just so that we can hear you, uh, so that we can hear your answers nice and clear. Okay. okay. So we're going to go ahead and get started. In order for the audience to understand the spectacular woman that you are today, I want you to paint a picture of where you came from. I'd love, you know, for you to share a little bit about your childhood and your family growing up. Okay, my, my childhood growing up, I was mostly fed Valium to keep myself quiet, and so I wouldn't act away. My father said I was I was acting, and uh, I, I, I was asked not to come to church because it's like, my grandmother and my mother and my sister's only person that accepted me to where I was and what I was. My grandmother kept me, she'd take me to, because in the summertime, they'd send me to Texas to keep me out of, out of, out of the, the way of the, the uh, but other people wouldn't see me because they thought I, I had a twin sister, but I didn't. It's like, I'd wait till my parents went to bed and I'd dress up like a, uh, my sister would dress me up. So I looked pretty. And, um, uh, and then uh, when I got old, uh, and wait, I just got confused. I, never mind. I, I got it all right. <laughs> no, that's okay, Miss. No, it's okay, Miss Patty. Go ahead. Because what, what scares me is back in the day from Wisconsin. Wisconsin's a redneck city, and uh, and and every time I give a talk like this or something, I'd end up in a hospital somewhere and getting conversion therapy. I got conversion therapy six times. The to, 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 uh, to tell me if uh, so, I would act like a, a man, a junior that I was, but I'm not a junior. It's like I didn't have those feelings. It's like just upset. To, and then I'd go to school, and they keep me. Uh, they would uh, put me in a special ed class because I didn't act like it. Because I I'd, uh, I'd put women's clothes on every chance I got because I felt better in women's clothes, and I couldn't understand why. And uh, it just upsets me sometimes because. That's where I felt, and I thought at one time I thought I'd just losing my mind because I felt better that way, and it was like uh, uh, when I was when I went to school, I I didn't have to go to gym. My uh, mother, uh, my mother and my father went to some doctor. Somebody gave me this special thing so I wouldn't have to go, and I didn't understand why I couldn't go to gym class because I loved climbing and I loved being with the boys because I like boys, and uh, oh god. <laughs> <laughs> and my, uh, I have four brothers and one sister. My brother, my mother would, would, uh, would bathe my two brothers, my four brothers together, two at a time. But she would never put me with them, and I couldn't figure out why. Why? What was wrong with me? And then, uh, at, uh, take your time, Miss Patty. <laughs> Seven years. At seven years old, my body started going through changes, and I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what was going wrong. And my mother, just they, and they start, they would start feeling me, feeding me failure. So I just shut up and wouldn't talk. And uh, it got pretty bad at times. And then I, and my grandmother, they keep my grandmother away from me because she tell me it's all right, baby. Uh, gotta take care to make you better. Yeah. But I just felt like I was in the wrong body or something wasn't right. And then they would, and then they would send me to the doctor and the doctor would uh, pull these, put me through all these examinations and they do mean things to me. And, and uh, I couldn't figure out why. 
I had a, I had a hole and I had a penis too. And I couldn't figure out what it was and why it was, why it was like that. And my grandma would tell me I'm just special, that's all. And then uh, when I got about eight or, we don't know, I think it was 10 or, 10 or 11 years old, I had surgery at the top where they just cut, cut my breast off and I couldn't figure out why. And my father said, you're a man and I'm gonna make sure you look like a man. And I said, well, what's that got to do with it? They didn't cut your chest off while they cut mine off. And then I, uh, I'm sorry. I no, it's okay. okay. It's okay, Miss Patty. Ann. And please, you know, share whatever you're comfortable with. Because I know this is difficult that the, the intersex community has very specific, um, a, a very insidious type of persecution. So please just share whatever you're comfortable with. And, yeah. you know, because I, I understand that those early years were very, very difficult. And I couldn't figure out what, every time my body would start to change one way, they, I'd go into the hospital, they would feel me very up so I passed out. They put them in my coffee, my tea, my milk or something, and I'd wake up and they, and I'd wake up and the doctor doing something mean to me. And, uh, and then all of a sudden they would either sew it up or, uh, or it wasn't there anymore. And uh, the worst part about it is when I started going through puberty, <laughs> everything was just weird. It was like the holes start, the holes start getting bigger and my penis start getting bigger and my balls wouldn't drop. So my father got upset and he started going through changes. He said, you just don't want him to. And then, then I went in the hospital and they tried to make them drop and they wouldn't. And then uh then that's when uh I uh my sister would put me and dress me up. What would always make me feel good if I could dress like a woman, that'd make me feel good. It'd make me feel real good. So my sister would dress me up. And yeah. it'd be all right. So my father got home and I'd wake up in the hospital and they and they would be shocking me and I couldn't understand why. Yeah. I didn't do anything wrong. No, oh, of course you didn't, Miss Patty Ann. Of course you didn't. Okay. Let's take a deep breath together. Yes. It's just, it's like my body was going through changes and I just, effort, and I couldn't figure out why. Yeah. 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 And my grandmother would try to explain it to me, but she was old and she just wasn't making any sense. And she'd take me to the church sometime in this little, lace out in the bonnet on. Mm. Well, uh, then, uh, go, go ahead. ahead. Then my father found out about it and he wouldn't let me go anywhere near her anymore. And that was when we were in Texas. It was just that I couldn't figure out why as long as I act like a man and, act, and wear men's clothes, it was fine. But I didn't feel comfortable in men's clothes. No. Yeah. And I hated, I hated, uh, uh Conversion therapy, I guess that's what they call it, but they would shock me and show me pictures that I'm supposed to, it's like they were training a dog or something. When you did good, you got good, but then they would shock you. And that was mean. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't feel right. There's, there's something really, there's something really insidious because persecution is already going to come from other individuals, right? But then when the system, when medicine is telling you that these types of, you know, therapies are, are, are the, you know, best practices, it's just so insidious and so evil. But uh, Ms. Patty Ann, after some time, you escaped, you got out of Wisconsin. You left Wisconsin and you ended up coming to San Francisco. So tell me about, tell me about that transition. How did you end up in the city? What happened was, I, 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 I just, uh, Miss Patty Ann just couldn't take that other person that was trying to come out. So I went to the doctor and I got implants and I, and I couldn't find a job anymore with implants in. And uh, I knew, I knew two lesbians that were here that didn't know how to raise children. And uh, that's one of my specialties raising children. Cause I, when I worked with the, uh, at uh, Janet Palmer Center, Recreation Center for the Handicapped, I uh, taught 
um, parents how to deal with disabled kids, and uh, I, and they didn't know how to deal with kids. They because they had two teenagers and one seven month old and one eight month old, and so I so I, I was only supposed to stay a week, but I got here and realized that you, that the gay people, the way they treat gay people in Wisconsin is terrible. And me being a intersex, they they just hated me. It's like church in church. They found out since my grandmother wanted to wanted to have me baptized, and oh God, they say we don't baptize one of the devil's children. So, oh God. Well, you're definitely not the devil's children. I know. I see. I see a, a box of tissues uh, floating uh, through. The, go ahead and grab one, Miss Patty Ann. Go ahead. We got We got to uh, clean up that pretty it face of yours. Like, it was. It's like I realized. Uh, and uh, when the last straw for my father was, is when I finally reached puberty and I realized he had sewed me up, and I started bleeding from my penis, and they couldn't figure out why I was bleeding, and uh, I went to the doctor. And the doctor said that I was having some kind of period or something, but because he had had it sold up, it was coming through my penis. Because at first they thought I had ulcers in my stomach, but I didn't. It was, yes, it was. It was just terrible. In Wisconsin, they hated me because it's like I was uh, just different. And they sent me to the doctors, and the doctors would have been testing. They would list me and everything else, and I didn't. Ever, and it was just terrible. Yeah. No. Then I got here in San Francisco and I realized that uh, it was places I'd be safe and I was a lot safer than here than I was in Wisconsin. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm so happy. One, I'm very happy that you're here in San Francisco because I got to meet you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Miss Patty Ann, I have personally uh, witnessed, you know, the grace and the care that you always exude. And I just so, I just want to say how much I appreciate how, you know, vulnerable you are willing to be. And, you know, we, we spoke about this uh, before this, you know, I wanted to make sure that this is something that you were comfortable sharing and speaking to, because it really, the conversation around the intersex identity doesn't get, um, you know, talked about enough. And so uh, when I mentioned that I've always seen the way that you move in this world, I just want to say how beautiful I think that is. Um, but, you know, while your life as a woman of trans experience uh, lent its own challenges, you've already spoken to the, um, you know, the challenges that you experienced as an interest, you know, when uh, you know navigating uh, your body being intersex, and the way that, and not 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 that your body is intersex, but the way that medicine wanted to treat this body, right? Because it's going to always force uh, us into these very particular boxes. So when you had come to this word intersex, when you had learned about this identity, what what did that what did that do for you? Uh, what did you feel when you came to understand that intersex was an identity that people uh, that people held? I felt I, uh, I felt closer to God because I realized I wasn't crazy that my body was going through changes because God had made me that way. Because once I said to my father and he hit me, he slugged me in the face was, you the one seated me, so how can I be one of the devil's children? And that, that only made it worse because my father was one of the first uh black colonels in this in the uh, state of wisconsin in the uh the marines and so i was uh, being a junior so i was supposed to I, I wasn't going into service i couldn't shoot a gun especially shoot it at somebody and that's just just upsetting but oh god it's just being an intersex and then I, when i finally realized what it what it was all about my life calmed down i just then i start start to put him back what they had took from me trying to build it back up. And when I first got here, I was I was talking to this, I was on the bus one day and, and I was crying. This lady asked me why I was crying and I told her I just don't feel good, something's wrong. And she told me to go to the Center for Special Problems. It's, it went out of business because they stopped funding it. It was on Jackson and Van Ness. And I went there and they uh, helped me find myself. And I realized that, uh, but, but first we, I don't went too far before that, uh, before I met the center for special Wisconsin for, for special. And th then I went there and they told me that I was, uh, uh, 
that I was a person of God, that it was just my body was going through changes. It let just let it go. Don't bother it. And to accept it and it all would all work out right. And I know then that I was in the right place and I was in the right state. Cause because every time I tried to figure it all out, they put me in conversion therapy and, and put me back on Valiums. And I was so tired of taking uh taking medicine for my body. And at one time I was uh I tried to put my best, I tried to put my, uh, my breast back and I went to this, I went to Chicago and these people are supposed to be putting uh, silicone in me and they put uh, car wax and mineral oil in me and, uh, and it, and it's, but they, what they didn't tell me is when I, when they did that, that I had to keep my bra and I couldn't take it out because when I, when I took my bra off about a year later, well, I was, I didn't have the same bra. On. It was just, you know, change it like you change underwear. But anyway, I went out dancing with it on and it, it exploded in, into my chest. And then I, uh, that's what I'm talking about. When you deal with uh, doctors back then, that was in the, uh, uh, the last, it was either the last of the 60s or the early of the 70s. The doctor put all that stuff in me. And then I found another doctor that would put the implants in. And uh, he didn't, he's supposed to take this, the silicone out and he didn't, he left it in there. And uh, I'm gonna, uh, that was when I was back in Wisconsin. Then, because I came out here, what, what, one of the reasons I came out here, I came out here to die because big pieces of my chest on this side and th this side, the silicone had, uh, what they had put the car wax in me, had started rubbing holes in the silicone bags and the skin just had started dying, so I couldn't I couldn't lay down and sleep. I had to sit up in the sit up in the chair like this because when I laid down, the the, the breast would go up under my arms, and no doctor would touch me to take it out. And the doctor that uh, did do it, he he died. So, mm. uh, uh, so but I can't. go, go ahead. ahead, finish that thought. I'm so sorry, Miss Betty. Ann. So the doctor, so I didn't know what to do. And the girls told me that, uh, that I was going to babysit for it to come out here. We'll help you deal with it. Mm. And so they were right when I came out here. Yeah. And then eventually, uh, Miss Patty Ann, you connected with Open. I mean, I met you through this work here, right? And we've developed uh, this wonderful friendship. And so now after you've engaged with Open House, but now you are here and you're you know connected with community so what is your life like today you know how, how do you feel now uh, after all of these experiences that you've had because of the way the systems have you know really harmed you what is your life like today it's a lot better because it's like how i found open house was i used to go to uh castro senior center and michelle that they, they used to work here but she's uh she's gone i just love her to death uh she used to come to uh to uh the Castro Senior Center. She was trying to start a program with uh, for uh, uh, for gay people, transgender, and and uh, in, for anybody that was gay that, that needed it. So she started the program, and all of a sudden the program fell apart. And she said, "Well, I know some place where we I can take you where you'll feel a lot better." And she brought me. She brought me here because then I was living in the Tenderloin in this uh, in this. I paid eight hundred dollars for this room. It was about as big as a closet, and uh, right in the middle of the war zone. And then uh, she helped me. Uh, I was what I was, and then I had went to a housing thing that they had here at Open House. They taught me how to apply for uh, for ownership. I mean, apply for uh, for uh, for uh, oh god, for getting an apartment, and. Uh, and I went to get an apartment in where I'm living in now, which I'm there five years now. And uh, they they do the uh, they were doing the. Uh, she was asking me questions, and she asked me uh, on the vacation. She said, "Are you he, she, or, or he, she, or are you he or she or other?" And I said, "The other." And the face dropped. She said, "No, we can't have that. You can't have your kind here." And I thought, "Oh God." And I said, but she had showed me the thing with two or three times. So I came back here to, to uh, open house and Beck was here then. And Beck said, no, they can't do that. And so Beck called them and, and asked them if what the problem was and they explained it to her. And she said, well, we can either 
have you, you can't do that. Either we can have some people come in and talk to you about it, or you can accept Patty Ann. And, uh, and so they decided they didn't want nobody to come in and, and then, uh, to make sure they knew what it was and they knew everything was going out, uh, uh, was going on. Open house did a whole series. I mean, they came in and with a movie crew and everything and, uh, <laughs> and did, and did the, the whole place and pictures of everybody, me and my apartment and everything else. So if anything happened to me, they, <laughs> they didn't know what it was. It's mm. I think uh, God for open house. Cause I, I don't think I'd be alive today if it hadn't been for open house. Miss Patty Ann, I'm so, so grateful that I've been able to not only meet you and learn about your story, but to actually have developed this friendship because you are just, I just have so much respect for you and I'm so grateful for our friendship. So thank you so much, Miss Patty Ann, for sharing your story. Okay, thank you. I, I, yeah. This is the first time I was able to share my story and admit being an intersex and don't and don't have uh, you have to take their shock therapy afterwards mm. for shame in the world. Yes. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Patty Ann. So for our next speaker, or storyteller, I should say, I'm going to be introducing Miss Billy Cooper. Miss Billy is a 61-year-old, unapologetically black transgender senior. She was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and she is a retired disabled United States Navy veteran. She served in Hawaii at Pearl Harbor and was in the military for a total of eight years right after Vietnam. She has also served her community in San Francisco for over 35 years. For the last three decades, Miss Billy has been a powerhouse and helped shift the way other people view our transgender community. She has been in recovery for 19 years as a motivational speaker, community liaison and leader, activist, founder of the Trans Life Support Group at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation and the Trans Resilience Support Group at Open House. And if that isn't enough, Miss Billy has been nurturing a new dream, a new ambition to enter a life in politics to directly address the needs of the trans community. Welcome to the stage, Miss Billy. And I think Miss Billy might be having some technical difficulties. We'll give it like 30 seconds. If we have to um, adjust, we can totally do that. But I'm just so grateful to be having these three storytellers present and, and a part of this uh, this program. So we'll just give it maybe five seconds, and you guys can all just look at me. Here I go. Oh, here you are, Miss Billy. Hey, the sound went off a little. That's OK, Miss Billy, because the hey. sound is on now. You're live and in color, okay. Miss Billy. Now, did, can y'all stand the truth, honey? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the people are going to have to be, aren't they, Miss Billy? I'm a, I'm, I missed my introduction because the computer went off. Well, it was good. I promise but you. I gave I gave them the full. Yes, as long I gave as them you, full. As long as you said what I what I prompted you to say. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm so grateful that you're here, Miss Billy. And I'm so grateful for you, Ephraim. My word, you are the quintessent quintessential interviewer. You <laughs> are talking. Oh my God, you're doing a better job than that Don Lemon. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, Ephraim, Thank you, you have Billy. a career on TV. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Billy. But, but oh Miss Billy, God. this isn't about me. Today is about you, Miss Billy. Well, Cooper. that's true. That's so true. let's let's jump right in. But thank you but so much for the But it is about you too. It is oh, about you, you too. Because thank I you, am Billy. part of you, and you are part of me. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. So let's go ahead and jump right in because I really want the audience to hear about your story. Yes, and y'all forgot to put Miss Billy Cooper on my name. Y'all put we'll, we'll, Miss Billy Cooper. We'll make sure to adjust that in the future. I promise, yes. Miss Billy. So uh, I want to start out. I want to start out my series. And of I'm 63, not 61. Oh, excuse me. My apologies, Miss <laughs> Billy. Uh, yeah, and uh, the corrections will keep coming, I know. <laughs> I want to start out my series of questions with you in the exact same way that I started with yes. Miss Penny. So can you share, uh, Miss Billy, with who Miss Billy was before the world knew who Miss Billy was? So tell us about your childhood and what those early years were like. Well, honey, coming from the diva herself, I was born um, 63 years ago in, Philadelphia, in a small town called Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, honey. And um, I, I lived in, back then we called it ghettos. Black people lived in the ghetto. Some black people did. 
but I was I was born when I came home from the hospital. I went to 1929 North 9th Street in Philadelphia, and that was considered a black ghetto. The same race of people uh, with the same economic, pretty much the same economic and social, um, you know, um, uh, uh, life, lifestyle. You know, we had the same disparities. We were held racist and prejudiced against the same way. And we were marginalized long before Miss Billy Cooper found out what being marginalized and and living below the poverty line, I that was my upbringing in Philadelphia. And you know, I back then, you know, I knew I was a woman, honey. I knew I was a. Uh, I knew physically, I didn't have a. At the time, I didn't know they were called vaginas, but I knew that I was. I wasn't a little boy, and I knew that, you know, me chasing the little boys around and playing jacks and you know, playing with dolls and being everybody's mother. I had, I ha I have had a nurturing disposition about myself for probably over 50, 50 years. You know, I've been doing activism and advocacy long before I landed in San Francisco, honey, long before I got here, you know, and I keep telling people, you know, I never, I have never received a paycheck for my activism and advocacy and but and but my my um my love and my admiration for all my communities over the last 63 years you know has been heartfelt and true and i i love my people but you know i i've been doing it from the heart i've been doing it from the heart and not to say that people that get paid don't do it from the heart but i'm since i'm telling the truth so many people that do get paid for doing it don't give a fuck about us. They just want the paycheck and go home. Now I'm being the, telling the truth. And and to all you people out there listening, the older people know I'm telling the truth. Cuz I come from a time long before some white man sat in the room, some white people sat in the room and said, "Let's call those those effeminate those effeminate black people uh, and and and, pe and white people and Spanish people who think they're women, let's call them transgender. You know, I come from a time when we were called everything but a child of God. We were called homosexuals. We were called faggots. We were called queer. We were called dick suckers, cum catchers, drag queens. We were called so many names, but so many of so many of us, we were lost. And we didn't know what we didn't know what name to answer to, so you know we we grew up in a time, uh, you know I, myself I was confused and many of my, you know people in my life were confused. Yeah, and I, I miss Billy. I, when I always love I always love your truth. So <laughs> I'm so grateful for you. <laughs> I just, uh, but you know, but I, I appreciate that you touched on your activism because you're not, you know, incorrect. Obviously, there is there is something authentic about doing it because it is it is in within your everyday action. So I actually want to speak to your activism because so much of your activism finds its roots, you know, in your personal life experience. And I know you've shared in the past that you had received an HIV diagnosis at the at the height of the epidemic. So what did you notice? about the way cisgender men were receiving care in comparison to how our trans sisters were, uh, were receiving care at the time. <laughs> Ephraim, now you know me, you want me to tell the truth. <laughs> you know I want the truth. Well, this is the way my story goes, honey. This is my truth and it's many other people's truths. But when you work for an agency, you cannot have, you, can, you cannot have the same disposition and the same uh, uh, verbiage and, and, and speak about what's going on because you work at that agency. But Ms. Billy Cooper being a client for over 35 years, I can tell my truth, which is many other people's truth. Uh, I, I am many things, but I am also a voice for the voiceless and a voice for the underserved. I am but one of many. But I was deep in my addiction um, uh, in the early 80s. I was deep in my addiction. I knew that if anyone would would test positive for HIV, it would be Miss Billy Cooper. Because if I thought it had a heartbeat, I was having sex with it, honey. You know, I was doing things with it. 
but I went um, that that faith, that faith. You know, it's a, a faithful day, and it was a, a un a un it was an eventful day, and it was an uneventful day that I was um, tested for HIV because at the time. I tested May the 15th, 1985, and I knew that I was deep in my addiction, and the only reason I went to test was because I wanted that $20. But to go along with that, at the time, I was high. I was high every day just about, but I saw my sisters and brothers who were HIV positive just like some of the white boys, like like the white boys who were HIV positive. And we were dying in, in unexplainable numbers because we were not getting and uh, we were not getting adequate care. We were not getting we were not getting um stand a good standard of care. We were not getting nothing that our white counterparts, the white boys, the white gay boys were getting, because I don't know, it was like uh, usually, uh, usually we're not invited into the picture until last. We're not invited to do studies to to find out about um, different diseases and different vaccines until last. You know, all these people in in Washington D.C., all these high highfalutin political people and people in the know, quote unquote. You know. I don't understand. Uh, I'm 63. After all these years, when are these white people going going to get get a get a grip, get a clue, and realize that black people need um, cohesive and and loving care, just like the white people. I mean, just like the black people. I mean, just like the white people. I'm so confused. I'm so mad. I can spit right now. <laughs> But y'all know what I'm saying. Yes, you know, we as black people, we do not, we do not always receive ad adequate mm. care. It's better now today, but back in 1985, like I said, when May the 15th, 1985, I tested. This was when you had to wait two weeks. The the two weeks came. I I wanted that twenty dollars to go get high. They gave me the twenty dollars, but they said slow down. Sit down. We have. We want to talk to you. So they told me I was HIV positive, and it really didn't affect me. It didn't affect me because I was deep in my addiction, and I had to go get high with that twenty dollars. Because at that time, twenty dollars you could get a whole lot of drugs for twenty dollars back then. So yeah, but you know, in nineteen ninety, in the nineteen in nineteen ninety, I really started. Uh, wanting to be clean and sober. And I, I, I really started looking around because I knew who I was and I knew I wanted the best care and I knew I wanted the medicines and I wanted to be all I could be. Even though I was getting high, I'm still a, a valuable commodity. I'm still a valuable absolutely. human being. So, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, those are the early days of HIV. And, and everybody, everybody who was living back then who knows Black people were dying just like the white people, you know, but we were we were not getting the great care that the white people, the white gay boys were getting. And I'm not saying that as a racist statement. I'm just stating that as facts. It's the truth, you know. Yeah, so. absolutely, Miss Billy. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, my next question for you, Miss Billy, is <clears throat> again reflecting on your activism. So much about your activism for you, just like you mentioned, is not a formal job, right? It's in the the actions that you take every day. I and I have witnessed it in the in the few years that I've uh, you know gotten to know you. I've witnessed it firsthand. And with you, it, it can look like you know accompanying uh, one of the sisters to her hospital appointments because she doesn't have anyone else. But it can also look like a, a potential future uh, in politics, uh, which you have great ambitions to achieve. So, what drives that activism and care for this community for you? My motivation, my love of other people, my love of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because, you know, I am you and you are me. We're, we're one together. Our hearts beat at the same time. You know, we, I, I feel your heart and you feel my heart. We feel each other's heartbeat while we're feeling our heart beating. 
So it's it's just I love people, and you know I'm outspoken and I'm loud and I'm boisterous, and I know I get on some people' nerves, but you know, it's that's just the way it is. That's that's just the way it is. When you know my um life's plan was planned long before I was born. You know, I, I, I didn't have nothing to do with this, who I was to become or who I am today. You know, it's, it's like I said, I've been doing activism long before I landed in San Francisco. But my, when, I, when I came here, my purpose was to develop um, a system or to be part of developing a program or system or a, um, a game plan to help elevate black black people, because back in those days it was black people. It wasn't PI. It wasn't uh, black indigenous indigenous people of color. It was black and white, and green was the color of money. So I'm just saying, you know, black people. You know, we got to worry about. We had to worry about ourselves back then because we we were all we had. You know, I come from a time when people were only making less than $10 an hour, some people were making less than $7 an hour doing the work. You know, my DNA is in my community, San Francisco. Long before I knew it was District 6, I knew it was the Tenderloin. So blood, the blood that runs through my um, veins and my DNA is San Francisco's Tenderloin. You know, and right now, well, right now, they're really going through more high-end gentrification, which is wrong. All those people in City Hall, they know exactly what they're doing. And, you know, they're they're really trying to wipe out the tenderloin. But, yes, that is true. Right now, I have on my agenda is, is I am running. I am, I am a political candidate now. I, Ms. Billy Cooper, am running for the seat uh, in District 6. San Francisco Tenderloin, south of Market, and um, um, uh, China Basin, and um, Mission Rock and Mission Bay, running for District 6 Supervisor. You know, I am so tired of people creating my life story. I am tired of people writing my story, and when they write my story, they write other Black people's story, too. I am so tired I'm just, oh, I'm so, I'm just tired of all the rhetoric and the, oh, I'm just so tired because I am you and one, I am someone that needs to be in the District 6 supervisor seat because me as a black person, can't no white person uh, uh, determine how I live or make the rules for me or make laws for me. I have to be on the inside. I cannot the only thing I can promise is that I will fight for you if you live in District 6. I will fight for you, uh, LGBTQQIA. I will fight for black trans women. I will fight for all trans women. But I have to, I am pro-black and I have to put myself first and my people first. So yes, I am doing, I'm going to do my best to win. But you know, um, there, there is opposition when a black person decides to run for to run politically. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard. It's hard. But you know, I stood up the H. I stood up to all the disparities in my life leading up to HIV. Mm -hmm. I'm a United States veteran. I stood up to the VA when they would tell him. I stood up to the military when they were telling me I wasn't who I was. You know, I'm I'm a fighter. I'm a Absolutely. fighter, and I'm so proud. I'm so proud to have thrown my hat in the political ring. So you know, and, and, and you know, Miss uh, Billy. Yeah, I, I I have so much respect for you, Miss Billy, because even earlier when you mentioned that it, you might sometimes uh, make uh, bring up discomfort in others, uh, you know, I if if someone's truth brings up discomfort that's an opportunity to run straight towards that discomfort because there's something to unpack there, right? And so, and so I appreciate that, you know, you're, I guess, self-aware about, about how that might come off to some people, but that leads me to my next question, which is, I mean, of course, like I've already stated how much, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in continuous awe of who you are. And at first, 
glance, people might see a woman who refuses to let her voice be silenced, unapologetic, uh, unapologetic Black trans woman. But behind that, you know, tenacious vigilance also exists a soft and compassionate woman. So despite all of the, you know, city grants, the nonprofit work, the contracts. Uh, can you share with the audience, the, with the folks that are uh, listening, and you have about three minutes to answer this, uh, okay. that, and, and share with the audience how the LGBTQ community, but the trans community specifically, can be better served? Talk, but well, you know, um, talk to us. Talk to us, you know, not always in a group. Talk to us one on one. Come down to our level, you know, because at the end of the day, uh, those people, social workers and case managers and people, uh, the CEOs and uh, executive directors, their life is different from mine. You have to lower yourself and do your best to be compassionate and have not always, you know, have some sympathy, but have more empathy. You know, come down and with a mindset, you, you know, don't look through us. Don't look around us. Don't talk above us or under us. Talk to me as a human being. You know, talk to me like a human. I am a human being. You know, stop wanting to write to write the story of Miss Billy Cooper and my sisters and brothers. Let me tell you the story. Let me show you the story. You know, I'm sick and tired of people writing the script for black people. You know, I really am. So you know, I heard what um. Tony Newman said earlier about respect. Respect has a whole lot to do with it. But for how many how many hundreds of years have we been talking about respecting each other and people just ain't doing it? Okay, we need more than just talking about it. We need we're gonna have to inject some uh, some get right into these people like like we're injecting the vaccine in us now. We need a vaccine. To stop make to help people stop being ignorant, <laughs> we need a vaccine to to make people respect everybody. We'll, we'll reach out. We'll, we'll, we'll reach out to some of the research departments and have them yes, start working that's on that. What we need to do. <laughs> that's what we need to do. But the most important thing, Ephraim, is thank you for doing this. And you know, anytime you need me, I'm here. You know, um, you know, it's just that we have to do better, and it's not always true. If you know better, you do better because it's not. Millions of people know better, but they don't give a fuck about doing better. So I'm just here to tell you, this is my courtroom, and I'm Miss I'm 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 Madame Miss Billy Cooper. Yes, and you are. That's just the way it is, but it has to change. I won't see none of this change in my lifetime. I won't. You know, I'm gonna do everything to keep alive, honey. I. I I want to live forever, but I know it's impossible. But you know, yes. Ephraim, what you what you're doing for our community is so wonderful. You know, um, I see a big future for you. I'm so happy to call you my friend. I love you so much. I love you. You know, and we really need this. We really need this. Yeah. So appreciate you telling your story. And I have so much respect for you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, America. Thank you. My name is Miss <laughs> Bill Cooper. And I'm running for District 6 Supervisor in San Francisco. <laughs> All right, Miss Billy. Ah, talk Thank to you, soon. you. Love you. Love you and up next, our final storyteller, Ms. Donna Persona, is an artist, a performer, who first hit the stage with the legendary Coquettes. She was the subject of the 2013 Iris Prize winning short, My Mother by Jay Bedwani. She serves on the board of directors uh, committees for Trans March and the Transgender Day of Remembrance and has been working to gain wider visibility for the transgender rights. Welcome to the stage, Miss Donna Persona. There she is. There she is. Yes, uh, How thank are you, you for having me today. I'm so uh, happy to have you, Miss Donna. I feel honored. This is an honor for me, <laughs> and it gives me an opportunity to continue with uh, the story I want to put out there uh, in, about transgenders, uh, I mean, all human beings and the LGBTQ community. But I, I always go toward the margins the, where, where I feel the most work needs to be done. And that is with people of color and the transgender community in my own community of the, 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 the larger LGBTQ community. 
fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So the same way that I started with uh, both Miss Patty Ann and Miss Billy Cooper, I really want to start with a similar question with you. What is Miss uh, Donna Persona's origin story? Tell me about your early years, your childhood, and how you came to find yourself here in San Francisco. Okay, uh, I'll start this way. I was uh, born in Texas in 1946. So if you all know arithmetic, that's 75 years ago. And, and uh, I, I, I make a joke about it, but my, my family moved from Texas and we, we are of uh, Mexican heritage. Uh, everyone in my family, and there's over a hundred, if you count all the generations, uh, we were, everyone was born here, except my father was born in Mexico. Uh, so, uh, my father was a Baptist minister and my mother was the preacher's wife. And my father was sent to California to, to found a, uh, Spanish language, Spanish speaking Baptist church. So, uh, but I like to joke around and say that somehow or other, they got the hint, my mother and father, that... I wouldn't make it in, in, in Texas. I wouldn't be alive. They wouldn't let me live in Texas. So they brought me here to, to a, a more liberal state. Uh, and so I wanna say that uh, from the beginning uh, of my life, or you know, when I was at four or five years old, I understood that I had, a, I call them three dings against me. I was uh, called, I was thought of as a dirty little Mexican and we was poor, we were, we were poor, considered poor. And, and I was uh, gay at that time or homosexual. And, and, and uh, so, so that made it tough for me. And, and I, I wanna say this, that uh, I, I come from uh, a, a unconditionally loving family. My, my mother and father <clears throat> both uh, uh, loved me, my family loved me. So I never found out that there was anything wrong with me at home. But as soon as I left the house, uh, I entered a minefield when I left home because uh, I, I got. Uh, really I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, uh, Donna, to interrupt. Do you mind leaning in a little bit? Because I want to make sure everyone can absolutely hear everything that you're offering. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, I'm I'm saying that uh, I, I was loved unconditionally at home, even though my 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 family was a Christian family, a Baptist. I never found out anything was wrong with me at, at home. But when I left home, the moment I left home, I entered a minefield uh, of abuse and bullying and, and name calling. So I learned to, to uh, shut that out. But I, I like to say this to remind people that, that are coming up today. Uh, I was all alone in the universe about my orientation. I had no one to talk to about it. There was no language for it. And, and I remember uh, in our home, we, ha we had a, uh, uh, a library. I picked up this uh, hardbound red book one day and it was all about uh, medicine and health. And uh, I opened it up to a page and that's where I saw uh, about homosexuality. And in that, in that chapter there, I learned that it was an abnormality it, it, it was a mental, uh, a mental condition. It wasn't normal. Uh, and, and that uh, it said there that some of the, the systems to work for it is to separate the child from the family. Uh, and, uh, you know, from that moment on, I thought I can never tell anyone. I, I'm just a child. I'm eight or nine years old. I must never tell this secret because my family, my father will, will be run out of town. He won't be able to be a minister anymore. You know, I, I want you to imagine the, 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 that on my shoulders, uh, an eight-year-old child. Yeah, of and, course. And, and not having anyone to talk to about it. 
So, uh, you know, in school, I, I couldn't focus on things, even though I had a loving family. Uh, in every school that I went to, uh, grammar school, middle school, and high school, I was separated from, from the other students. And, and I was uh, put in rooms and, and with, with uh, people like in, in uh, grammar school, I remember uh, somebody showed me ink blots, ink blots. And they said, they asked, what do you see here? I said, well, I see that you spilled ink all over the place. Uh, you know, that, <clears throat> and, and, but I didn't know what was going on. Like, well, mm -hmm. you know, why are they doing this to me? And then in middle school, the same thing. And, you know, I don't know that, that uh, grammar school is called the middle school. Uh, so, so uh, you know, that, that, doesn't involve, that doesn't make me feel good about myself. Like, okay, the message I'm getting is uh, I'm, I'm not supposed to be here. There's something really wrong with me. Uh, and uh, and so then in high school, they, they uh, the school had me see a psychiatrist. You know, it happened that I, I went to school in San Jose. The, the this high school and invited a psychiatrist to see s certain students, and, and so I, I met with this psychiatrist in high school, and uh, um, he 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 wanted to take me on after his volunteer. Uh, session with the school, the high school. So I, I, I saw him for two years, you know, weekly. And, you know, I found out later that while I was seeing him, he put me on lithium. And, and uh, you know, that, that really boggles my mind. And really, I, I'm, I'm terribly, terribly upset about that. Because I, I found out later that that was the first psychotropic drug used in America, and uh, I will say this, like, you know, maybe they gave it to skinny, poor Mexican freaks first to test it out. And I can't imagine that my parents would sign that that's okay. You know, I'm trying to put this together, and, and I can't anymore because my parents are gone. But, you know, maybe my... It, uh, I, I don't remember that I ever asked my parents to sign anything, but but uh, I, I think I still have effects from that lithium that he had me on for a year, and and I don't remember feeling anything. So anyway, that, that th those are some of the ways that I, I uh, my childhood was. It was so lonely, it was so scary, but you know, kind of on the fun, fun side, um, I wanted I, I was a little girl. To me, I was a little girl, and, and I wanted, uh, I knew I was a little girl because I played with dolls with my sister, and we played jacks instead of marbles, and, and, and no, nobody said I couldn't. But, you know, my when I was in uh, middle school and high school, my sisters had boyfriends, and, you know, I, I, I wanted that. I, was, I wanted that. So one thing I used to do, like I used to babysit for my sisters, well, I would find out the phone numbers of the cute guys cute guys at school high school and, and i would call them <laughs> and, and, and uh you know they thought they were talking to some cute girl and you know so that was one of the ways that that uh, that i uh, manifested who who i was uh, as a child but you know I, I i made it through my childhood and and, and uh, i acted out you know i i couldn't focus on high school uh, school work but but still, I, I, I managed to, to graduate, and, and, you know, because I'm, I'm a pretty smart person. Oh, of course you are, Miss Donna. <laughs> of course you are. That, that's my childhood a little bit. And, yeah. But I well, was it speaks so thankful that I had no one to talk to, mm. and, and it's different today. It's different it, today. What's really profound to me about what you just told us about your childhood specifically is that you were coming from a, a nurturing family, and yet... Yeah, yeah because of how, what's the word? Uh, the way that the systems metastasize, the way that they spread it, like, yes, of course, that's, that is foundational, of course, for any child to have that kind of nurturing, yet it's still not quite enough. If you have an entire world that once, 
you know, that doesn't want you here, that doesn't want you to exist. It's a, it's only so far that that nurturing can go. So it's just interesting to hear hear that because obviously for a lot of the queer community, it's not necessarily the truth that uh, they come from a lot of nurturing families, but even that isn't going to be enough when we have massive systems that's that are fighting that we have to fight against. So I so appreciate that that insight. So yeah, I want to move they, on to wanted me to be dead. They some you know the system. The message I was getting was. You should be dead. Exactly. No, exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much, Ms. Donna. So eventually you made your way here to San Francisco. And, you know, I really want to hear about what that was like. And so, um, you know, there's a lifetime of activism, of service, um, and life as an artist. This includes your time with the Coquettes, who were uh, an avant-garde uh, psychedelic hippie theater group in the late 60s, which is just like uh, fantastic, it's just magnificent. Can you share with me how you got involved with that and how art has shaped your life and your activism? Okay, um, I'll, I'll start this way. I, I still had residue or not residue, but I, I wanted to keep my family safe. Uh, and uh, uh, I wanted to find a, 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 a faggot life. I wanted to find people like me. And, and I just felt like I had to get out of town for that. So, you know, jokingly, I'll say that I, I, I told my mom and dad, well, I'm going to go to so, some uh, uh, Bible studies. Uh, I'll be back later. And I, I would get on, a, I got on a Greyhound bus and I, I came to San Francisco uh, to perpetrate uh, a freer life, and, and uh, so so, and this is in the uh, '60s, 1960s. So that was the time of the hippie era, and, and so you know, I I turned on and dropped out, and, and uh, I I found the coquette. Somehow I found the coquettes, and maybe it was at uh, Golden Gate Park. They used to do shows there, you know, just for. Uh, getting dolled up, dressed up. And, and so anyway, I, 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 I met them. But I also uh, um, met a man at, at, at a nightclub. Not, now I'm in my I'm 20, something like that. Uh, and uh, at, at the Capri, Capri Club in, in uh, North Beach, uh, I met this man who, you know, who wanted to take me home that night. And, and uh, I, I went home with him and uh, found out, he turned out that he, he was the, uh, the producer of a movie for the Coquettes. And, and it was uh, Elevator Girls in Bondage. Not a good title. Don't you love that? Elevator Girls in Bondage. Uh, and and uh, so I, I, I was his uh, lover during that time, his date through that whole time. And he, he kept asking me, do you want to be in this movie? You know, I can put you in the movies. And I said, no, no, no. Uh, you know, that goes back to my, the, the way I was raised. I must not enter this world too much because it's just not safe for me. So, so and I also had stage fright. Uh, I, I didn't want to bring attention to me. And, and so I, 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 but he did, he did trick me, trick me into it. And so that gave me a, a level of fame because I'm in one of their movies and I, I, I was friends with them. And, and uh, so it, it was uh, an eye opener for me, but you know, I still didn't dress like a woman then, uh, uh, but, but that was the time of unisex clothes. So I, I, I say it this way, no matter what I put over my body, when it's on my body, it's woman's clothes. It's my body. And, and so uh, anyway, I, I, I got um, excited about uh, the theatrical life, the theatrical life. And, you know, uh, uh, then I left them and, and eventually left them. But then in like 2003, I, I saw in the newspaper, The Chronicle, that, that somebody was making a movie about the Cockettes. So I kept watching for that. And it came out. And, and I reunited with them. And then uh, Rumi Misabu, one of the coquettes, uh, uh, one of the lead coquettes, uh, started, uh, I, I st started a friendship with Rumi. And, and Rumi had salons, he called uh, salons for artists, and, and that came with performance. 
So Rumi Misubu gave me my first opportunity to perform. And that's when I donned a dress. I was 59 years old and I never took it off. Yes. Uh, you know, I, it, it took me a while. It took me a long time. But uh, now, uh, I mean, I was always, from day one, I was always authentic. Uh, I never try to butch it up. You know, I'm lazy about that. <laughs> I ain't going to try that shit. Uh, so I was always who I, who I am, but I, I blossomed. I came into mm. my truest self mm. at, at the age of 59. And uh, I'm going bonkers. Uh, you know, uh, the, the world is ready for me. And, and uh, so, you know, I have a lot of uh, 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 energy and, and imagination and, and creativity. And, and, you know, the foundation that I got was uh, uh, my confidence, gives me my confidence. Because I, I feel this way. Uh, and nobody, nobody is better than I am on the one hand, but I am better than no one. I'm a human mm. being and I'm fabulous the way I am. I, I love myself. Absolutely. I love that there was a metamorphosis, but also still consistent because it is always who you were, right? It's just the outward facing that you were able to then kind of really step into yourself, which is really beautiful. I finally felt free to be who I am. Yeah. yeah. And I want to, I want, you to expand a little bit because obviously in, sometimes in order for us to really understand who we can become, it happens when we witness other people living their truth. So, you know, I know that you've told stories of um, the 60s when you, when you first came to San Francisco, frequenting Compton Cafeteria. So at one point you had witnessed, you know, trans women for the first time. What was that experience like? Okay, that, that was, uh, you know, I already talked about after that, but that was uh, one of the best times in my life. Uh, I, I, this, I, I wasn't, uh, I was looking for a faggot life, as I said, but I couldn't go to bars and everything was secret back then. So, so uh, I, I went, you know, I could still dine. So, so I, I went to Compton's cafeteria. I found Compton's cafeteria. And that's what, um, you know, maybe everyone has this experience. That was the first time that some beautiful women I found out were born male. That was the first time. And, and, and uh, so I, I used to go into Compton's and, and I made friends with them. And actually, it was like a family. I, I, I adored them. It, it, it was, uh, and, and I will say the Tenderloin at that time was uh, better than Disneyland. You know, I, 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 I would go to the Tenderloin and I was in a magic place, absolutely magic. Oh, that's so and, You beautiful. know, it was filled with uh, uh, prostitutes, pimps, uh, drug dealers, drug takers, people who dealt in gambling, Ill illegal gambling and stolen goods. And it was wonderful. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, and, and uh, I'm telling you, it's so exciting. And, and, and uh, actually, though, you know, sometimes I, I heard bullet shots and this mm -hmm. and that. But hey, that was like fireworks. But but uh, the these women, that's where I learned about making a family out of the people that, that you're with. Uh, the these ladies were, were a family to each other. And I was their little kid. I was theirs too. And, and this informs who I am today and, and my activism then. I know firsthand that they were wonderful people. They were beautiful people, and, but they were thrown away from, from their families. And they were among the most brave people I ever met in my life because they were gonna live authentically when all the odds were against them. And, you know, as soon as they did that, their lives were totally criminalized. Let's say they weren't criminal before, you know, just because the, they knew, in this case, women, they knew that they were women, they were totally criminalized at that moment. And they did sex work because that's all there was for them. 
And you know, something about that was uh, I never heard about the, the Johns going to jail, never. So, it, you know, they, they managed to be criminal by themselves, only they were having sex with, with these men. And, and uh, so, so uh, uh, one thing I like to say about that is uh, I found out, you know, 50 years later that really what they were doing, there was nothing wrong. But, you know, they, they were born, they lived for a while, and most of them died, never getting that validation. And, and that drives me. And, and, and also uh, the, the fact that, you know, that story was uncovered. You know, it was hidden for 45 years. And, and uh, that is one of my things that drives me. Like, uh, I can't imagine what if it had ne stayed buried. Uh, so so uh, I'm, I'm going to make keep that story going through eternity. And, and I want it to be taught in schools. I'm going to take every opportunity I have to tell that story. And, and you know, I already co-wrote a play about it. And, and uh, so I'm doing honor to those ladies. They, I, I just want to believe that they know somehow that they were wonderful heroes. And another thing about that is I have this thought that... Um, uh, rights and, and social justice and liberation that's won is best won when it's won by the constituency that, that, that wants it. In this case, it was transgender women, women of color, who, who rioted. It was a riot. Uh, uh, and uh, so they won their own rights. So, I, you know, I'm not going to let anybody say, because I've had like straight people say, we, we've given you the right to marry. I said, you, you haven't given me anything. And, and you know, uh, not even the LGBTQ community has given me uh, and my, my, the transgender community anything. We got it ourselves. These ladies did. And, and, and I'm a part of that because I'm telling their story. And, you know, I, I've taught this story in middle school. <laughs> yes, you know, it, it's because uh, some people are saying there's pushback. Well, that, that's too adult. Hell no. No, this is the truth. This is history. And, and so, you know, all, all my dreams are coming true. Uh, I, 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 I get so joyful about that. That's so beautiful, Ms. Donald. I hope that answers So beautiful. Oh, absolutely. Oh, you're answering my questions, Ms. Donna Persona. I promise you. Um, my next question for you is that, you know, you are you are a resident here at Open House, and so uh, in our housing community, and so you are a thriving member of this housing community. So I want to know, you know, you're, not only are you engaged in all of your activism, you perform all of the time. You're still you. I think uh, if if I'm not mistaken, you had um, uh, an art piece on display uh, recently. Yeah. So you are still, you know, so engaged in this community. So what? What was that? At Fort Mason. At Fort Mason, that's correct. So it's like, what drives you and your work, and and at this pace and this cadence that you that you uh, embody? Well, uh, I I will say that that uh, I like making history. I like being part of history. Uh, you know that that that's self centered to, or it's about me. But you know, I I'm 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 visibility. You know, when you look at me, you see somebody who's seventy five years old, who's transgender. And uh, this is, I'm not waiting to die, I'm living. I'm living and I'm living a vital life. I'm, I'm doing wonderful things. And every time, whatever I do, it, it, it's activism. You know, like in this case, it, it, it's an art piece, it's mixed media, but the story, in this case, it's Black Lives Matter. You know, everything I do is, is activism. You know, and I do drag shows uh, routinely. I just did two last weekend. Uh, every song I pick has a story that I want to put forth. And, and, and so uh, I'm driven by that, uh, an opportunity to reach more people. Uh, you know, actually, like, I wouldn't be satisfied until every human being in the universe knows who I am and, and what I stand for and bring my community in with it. You know, we, we are doers. Uh, you're not handing us anything. Uh, uh, we're getting it for us and, and we're fabulous. We're beautiful, we're fabulous. Uh, and uh, 
you know, get out of my way. I, I, I don't ask people to, to like me. You know, I like to sing, you, you don't have to like me. You don't have to like me. You know, just get out of my way and give me my rights. Uh, and and uh, so I'm, I'm going to, that drives me. That, that gets me energized. And, and uh, you know, so, so uh, I, I love life. And, and um, life has let me live this long through the choices I made. And, and so I, I'm, I'm giving back uh, or I'm giving. Uh, uh, as, as Billy, uh, Miss Billy said, I love people. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm just human. I'm just human. And I think you are too. And, and, and I love humans. I love humans. And we love and, you, Misano. <laughs> thank you. And, and so I, I want to, I want to give, I want to give, you know, I, I give it, most of what I have. I give away. Yeah. I give away. I, I, I learned that from my family. You know, you, you, you don't, it's better to give. You know, I, I don't take so much. I give, 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 give. And, and, and that's what I'm here for. And I have a lot to give and I have a lot to say. And, and uh, I hope it's welcomed. Oh, it is. Trust me. Trust me. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question from uh, an audience me a member named Robin. Uh, and uh, they would like to know, what is the play name and where can they find it? What is the what? The I play. Think... Oh, the play, yes. The, the name of the play is uh, Com uh, Com Com uh, Compton's Cafeteria, The Riot. That's the name of the play. And uh, we, in 2018, we had a successful, sold out 22 performances. Uh, and it was an immersive experience where people come to a diner. See, we were recreating Compton's diner. And uh, we found that that is so powerful because the audience, it's happening. It's happening before their eyes. And I, and I, I saw many of the performances and, and I, I, I would watch the audience and you know we scared the hell out of them when the cops came in to bust heads. And we, I saw them cry when, when the, the girls would tell their stories. I, I, I've heard many stories about their challenges. So, uh, you know, I, I want to announce also that right before COVID broke out, we signed a three-year contract to put it, bring it back. And, and this time we got a restaurant given to us for three years that uh, holds twice as many people. And, and my plan, our plan for that is it's going to be a center for transgender uh, advocacy. L like in the daytime, uh, transgender men and women will learn hospitality services, chefs, and, and also like a, a resource center. It's going to be all about transgender all day long, every day. And then in the evening, we'll put on the play. And, and so three, for three years, and, and uh, I want to also say, so, so look out for it. And, you know, if you follow me on any social media, you, we're, we're going to let you know. We're going to let you know. And, you know, I want to add to that that uh, we have since written a movie script of the same story. And we've expanded and, and added more stories. And I want to I wanna brag a little bit here. Please go ahead, go right ahead. We have about a minute left, but take that minute and brag. Yeah, we, we, we did a pitch. We did a pitch for it. And uh, so far, Warner Brothers has uh, said that they would read the script for with us or for us. And, and then uh, the, the producers of, uh, what is it? Tr Transparent, uh, a, a show, a, a successful show about transgenders they're they're reading it and then the same producers of uh disclosure where my friend laverne cox is, is in wow uh, so uh we're gonna bring it to to the big screen with more stories so that history is never going to die and you know that history brings it here to san francisco mm -hmm. and 
more pointedly, the transgender community. So, so that keeps me awake and moving. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Miss Donna Persona. That I just am so grateful for all, all three of you that have shown up and so grateful for your story, Miss Donna. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. So thank you so much for these incredible stories, stories that have shaped and paved the way to the world we live in today. Um, so we're gonna move on to closing uh, this incredible event. Uh, this concludes day one. Remember, this is day one, we have day two. Day one of the Open House LGBT Elder Housing Services Virtual Symposium. Please do not forget to return to part two of this incredible program. Same time, just tomorrow, 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, 2, 12, 1, 2, 2 p.m. Uh, um, Eastern Standard Time, and so, with part two of this incredible program, we will continue our conversation tomorrow from a clinical roundtable discussing the delicate formula that allows our elder community to thrive at home. Like I said, the program will begin at the same time, but tomorrow, the same link that was sent out today, but we will send out a reminder email. The roundtable will be followed by workshops for the second half of the day. And many thanks to our collaborators at SAGE and to the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation, whose generous contributions made this all happen. Remember, simply use the same link you used to join us today and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>